Mr. P.B. Deshmukh to give his speech, please. Uh, before that, uh, let us welcome our guest. I would like request Dr. Harish Agarwal to uh, felicitate our guest. Over to you, Dr. Deshmukh. Very, very, very good morning to all of you. My name is Deshmukh, and I have been entrusted the responsibility of convener. That's why I'm here. I welcome all the guests who are tardy particularly Dr. Bhagavat, who gave us the opportunity to have the dysfunction here. I will not go in details about the role and uh, mission of uh, our society. Harish is going to anyway talk about that. My request will be, uh, at the end, please give us feedback to improve upon our event. And I'm sure that you will definitely get good information from these presentations. And you will have, you will enjoy this event. Just to stop, I remember Ashwin Dhani, who passed away in uh, September, the legend of paint industry, and on behalf of our society as well as on behalf of all of you, I pay my all repute, repute to him. May his soul rest in peace. Enjoy the event. Thank you. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Harish Agarwal to tell us more about the society. Good morning, everyone. नमस्कार सुप्रभातम आप सभी का आइसर के ज्ञान दीप मंडप में सबका स्वागत है इट इज ए ग्रेट प्रिविलेज टू वेलकम एवरी वन टू द मेगा फ्लैगशिप इंडस्ट्री इवेंट सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ फ्रंटियर्स ऑफ नॉलेज एजुकेशनल सीरीज इन कलर पिगमेंट्स पेंट्स कोटिंग एंड कंस्ट्रक्शन केमिकल एट मदन मोहन मदन मोहन मालवीय हॉल आईसर पुणे एट द आउटसेट आई वुड लाइक टू रिकॉग्नाइज अवर डिस्टिंग गेस्ट हु ऑनर एस देयर प्रेजेंस टूडे रिस्पेक्टेड चीफ गेस्ट प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर सुनील एस भागवत गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर मिस प्रिया भूमकर एम डी सौजन्या कलर गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर मिस्टर अशोक गुप्ता अनफॉर्चुनेटली ही हैज नॉट कम सी ओ ऑफ द 
पेंट एंड कोटिंग स्किल काउंटर काउंसिल मिस्टर जगदीश आचार्य फ्रेंड्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम ए लॉस ऑफ वर्ड टू एक्सप्रेस माई ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ईच ऑफ एवरी वन हीयर टूडे आई कैन ओनली थिंक टू से थैंक यू सो मच फ्रॉम द बॉटम ऑफ माई हार्ट इट इज अमेजिंग बींग एबल टू स्टैंड बिफोर द गैलेक्सी ऑफ स्टार प्रेजेंट एंड शेयर दिस स्पेशल मोमेंट विथ यू फ्रेंड्स द सरफेस कोटिंग सोसाइटी इट वॉज फॉर्म इन द ईयर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन एंड वी हैव टेकन दिस इनिशिएटिव एट आई सी टी मुंबई प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर ए बी पंडित ही हैज सपोर्टेड लॉट इन दैट्स एंड द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ टुक प्लेस एंड द फर्स्ट प्रोग्राम ऑफ द सरफेस कोटिंग सोसाइटी इट वॉज लॉन्च इन द ईयर टू it was an a huge program with the mission and ambition to promote the education in the field of coating industry our main interest is to connect the institute with the industry people this is our main motto we want to connect industry to the institution so this will be in a particular all type of r and d work or anything you want to do you can just do with the institution so this is our main education uh, aim to promote the education now i don't want to talk much about the industry industry mr jagdish acharya ji is there he will give you the briefing about the industry what is the paint coating industry scenario is there so presently i'll tell you the msme and the organized and unorganized sector the total capacity of our industry is around 70000 crore which include both msme and the organized sectors so msme they are playing an important role they generate the employment also and they will give the different good quality of products so here at surface coating society our aim is to give the newer technology to the people so they can improve their production and they can go through different time this time we have included the construction chemical also this is a very important segment for the coating industry nowadays what happen you know those who are making uh, paints they have started making construction chemical and those who are making construction chemical they have started manufacturing paint because almost 50% of the raw materials are same for both so this way they are also doing the good work <coughs> now at the last i'll be very happy and say all sponsor are they have given lot of tremendous support to us without their support this would, program would not have been possible so my thanks to all the audiences thanks to the staff of the icer thanks to professor bhagwat he has given the opportunity to take place this program here in icer program thank you very much I would like to call upon Dr. A. J. Singh to give us a short speech and uh, his tribute to. Welcome to the. event of today it's also a very surprising and shocking news last uh, september of uh, 28 passing away of uh, mr dani a well known person legend in the paint industry for a very very long time he was the person much behind the progress of asian paint now his son is also joined mr jalas dani we invited uh, mr jalas also for the event but uh, Incidentally, he is out of India, but he is sent.
you sir dr agarwal thank you dr agarwal for extending the invitation to mr jalas dani to attend the inaugural con- ceremony of your society as of now mr dani is scheduled to travel and uh, will not be able to attend the function mr dani conveys his best wishes for the grand success of the event thank you now at this moment let us stand for one minute in the honor of mr ashwin dani Now may I call upon Dr. Harish Agarwal to introduce uh, Ms. Priyamvada Bhumkar, Suyojana Colors Private Limited. I request to come Ms. Priya Bhumkar. She, Priya Bhumkar is the very leading lady entrepreneur in the field of coating industry. The Sojanya Color, she is the managing director of Sojanya Color and she is looking after the entire work of the Sojanya Color. Sojanya Color is producing lot of colorants for various industries, not only for the paint industries, they are pioneer in coating industries, they are pioneer in ink industries, they are pioneer in various kind of PVC soles and other industries also. So their production is very huge. I'll request Ms. Priya Bhumkar to please give his talk. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And a hello to all the dignitaries on the dais, to all the people who are here in the audience. Uh, it's nice to be a part of, you know, on a very nice, cool morning in Pune. It's very nice to be a part of this industry gathering uh, and to be amongst all of you here today. At the very outset, 
I want to congratulate the organizing team on this wonderful collaborative effort of bringing together two very important subjects. One is science and the other is people uh, through the three institutions, the Surface Coating Society, ISER, and the Paint and Coating Skill Council. All these three institutions are doing exemplary work for the advancement of science and in the, edu in the education and skilling of people who will carry the science forward. Secondly, my compliments to you also, uh, Dr. Agrawal and Dr. Singh, on the theme which you have chosen for this seminar, a celebration of frontiers of knowledge. The theme actually reminds me of my father-in-law, the late Sri C.J. Bhumkar. A lot of people here, I think, in the hall might have known him. Uh, I know that so many of you know him or knew, knew about his passion for knowledge. He truly lived, you will agree with me that he was somebody who truly lived in a celebration of the frontiers of knowledge his entire life. Knowledge is indeed stratospheric because it takes us out of the mundane. The very act of pursuit of knowledge transports us into new realms of wonder, exploration and excitement of broadening our frontiers of knowledge and going to places in our mind and in our imagination, places where we have never been before. This is indeed the most exciting aspect of the pursuit of knowledge. And in this process, it leads to new learnings and to growth for ourselves, for the cause of science, arts, life, and the entire universe. Coming to the field of paint and coatings, which is where I belong, and I've spent over three decades, and uh, before that, you know, even uh, in my youth, as a science student, I believe that this is a space where terrific opportunities are presenting themselves to broaden the frontiers of this industry through knowledge and through its reimagination. Let's take the case of paint and coatings. If you look at the industry of paint and coatings, this is an industry which hasn't changed in over 50 years. The way a paint formulation is conceptualized, is the same in the last 50 years. There is a binder, there is an extender, there are some additives, there's a pigment, and there's you know some other things. And the way that it is manufactured has remained more or less the same. The way that it has packed in the tubs and in the containers has remained more or less the same. The way that it is sold through the dealers and through the network you know, in the markets has remained the same. The way that it is marketed has remained the same. If you look at it, all the advertisements like Mera Ghar, Meri Diwar, etc., you know, the nice couple, or nowadays it's a lot of stars <laughs> who are advertising, that has remained the same. The way that, so the way that it is applied, you know, there are contractors, painting contractors, then you go, you pick up a painter, you do Kisai, and you know, it's a very painful process to get your house painted. Nothing has changed. But given how differently we live today, wouldn't it be very delightful if someone just came and told us, look, I'm going to paint your house, not in one month, but in one day. There is a scope for us to reimagine. Maybe it is just someone who comes with like high-powered spray guns and just sprays your house with whatever color you choose, whatever finish you want, including metallics or, you know, it could be anything. Imagination <laughs> is the only limit, I think. Or you completely change this whole process and you have like really nice with a beautiful sheen latex rolls. Someone just comes under the arm with the latex rolls and paste it and you're done. Not a wallpaper, I'm talking about emulsion paint. So, 
All it needs, really, is a reimagination of the business. Here's another take on the industry. Typically, the concept of paint and coatings is that one of coating of structures. So whether it is an architectural structure or whether it is, it's a bridge or it's, you know, vehicles or any kind of a structure. But today, why can we not actually, we, do, we don't have to imagine it. it is a reality, but we don't actually see it like that. Anything which has a surface is coated. Anything. And anything which is man-made has a surface to it. So, it could be paper, it could be glass, it could be plastic, it could be phones, windows, floors, plastic, agro products, even seeds are coated today, you know, agro seeds which goes for the sowing, those are also coated. Devices, implants, even stents are coated today. Textiles and all kinds of textiles, natural, synthetic, technical textiles, everything is coated wearables and even satellites with the ISRO. Everything is coated. There is nothing which is there in the world which is not coated. So now, how much wider are the frontiers for the coatings industry? And this idea of expanding the horizons of the industry is immensely exciting and presents a plethora of opportunities for its reimagination. Let's look at another perspective for the coatings industry. I'm talking about this because we are talking about frontiers of knowledge and you know something new which we have to imagine for the industry. And since I'm from the coatings industry, it's a subject which is very close to my heart and I'm very passionate about this. So I'm sharing some of my thoughts with you today on this. Let's look at this other aspect of coatings where Typically, there are two dimensions to a coating. You know, in general parlance, people say a coating is something which is used for decoration to make something look beautiful, like a beautiful house or a beautiful car or a motorcycle or a beautifully printed bridge or a ship or even an aircraft, you know, nice livery on an aircraft tail. It's all for the beauty. It's also for decoration and also for protection. But what about a third dimension and why can we not look at a third dimension for a coating today? That is one of functionality. And here coatings can become a contributor to the functionality which a product or something can deliver. It can become a significant contributor to this and here I will state some examples and these functionalities could be something like temperature control, keeping a building cool, going towards sustainability, making buildings or structures that much more energy efficient, dust repellency, energy efficiency, water repellency, water conservation and any other ideas which can impact climate change positively anti-pollution, for safety, health, environment, etc. And these ideas can really actually go on and on and on. So in my mind, I think it's very the right time and in, in the place where we exist today to bring in the dimension not only of protection and decoration but that of functionality in our coatings. And here again, this is expanding the frontiers of, you know, the knowledge and horizons for the industry. So. I think it's a very exciting topic. Thank you to the organizers for such an interesting topic for the conference. And we are looking forward to the speakers talking and sharing their ideas and thoughts on this subject over the next two days. Thank you very much indeed and have a great time.
thank you, ma'am. I would like to call upon Dr. Harish Agarwal to felicitate, ma'am, please. Okay, I'll call upon Dr. Harish Agarwal uh, to introduce Dr. Jagdish Acharya, please. First of all, uh, Madam Priya Bhumkar, she was talking about the theme celebration of frontier of knowledge. This is really, to be very frankly, I'll tell you, this theme is not given by me. We decided among the committee, and Dr. Srivastava is responsible for this. He suggested theme should be frontier of knowledge, not the general themes. He has specialized the themes. So thanks to Dr. Srivastava that appreci everyone appreciated the theme. Secondly, she was talking about the late Sri C.J. Bhumkar. See, I was the student in 1976. I did my MSc from Ruya College. After that, I entered into the career professor. I was professor at Mitibai College for the inorganic chemistry. And in the meantime, at that time, the SYJC College started. This was the first year for SYJC. So I was chosen as a HOD for the SYJC. Then I got an opportunity, there was advertisement in the paper for the post of R&D chemist in Asian Paints. So I just uh, applied and I got interview call. So Mr. late Mr. C.J. Bhumkar, he was my industry guru, he took my interview and I was entered into the Asian Paints. Now regarding I'll, uh, Mr. Jagdish Acharya, he is the CEO of Paint and Coating Skill Council. He is having experience over 40 years of corporate experience in the paint industry, of which 25 years were spent in international market of South Africa, Pacific, Australia, China and East Asia, joined Asian Paint as a branch executive in 1979 and retired from Asian Paint as a chief executive officer of PPG Asian Paints in 2014 and was advisor to Asian Paint from 2015 to 2016. Advice Asian Paints and corporate on CSR have worked with the least eight NGOs closely. He is very, very closely associated with the Paint and Coating Skill Council and he is very expert in giving the data about the paint industry. So I will request Jagdish Acharya ji to come and give his presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, members of the Surface Coating Society, it is with great honor and privilege that I stand before you to celebrate the frontiers of knowledge in colors, pigments, paints, coatings, and construction chemicals. These elements are not only foundational to our daily lives, but they also possess an enduring power to shape the world around us. I completely endorse Madam Priyamvada Bhunkar's views on what could be the frontiers of knowledge for these segments. <clears throat> I was asked by Dr. Harish Agarwal to speak a little bit about the industry. See, our industry, I don't want to go dwell more on it, I would rather speak about the how we have celebrated this frontiers of knowledge. So since he has asked me, I'll just be a little brief here on the industry. As he said, it's a 70,000 crore industry. 
in India, the per capita consumption is very low uh, compared to developed standards. We all talk about India attaining uh, very high ranking in GDP. That would necessarily mean that the growth in paint industry is going to be double digit for at least another decade. And that's a growth premium which no other segment in India offers. Our industry is skewed. There is a bit of a monopolistic kind of situation with few companies managing 65% of the market and a large plethora of 2,200 companies. We call them unorganized, but they are quite organized in the small and medium sector. 25% of work that is being that's happened in, happening in the decorative segment is for new construction and 85% is refurbishment or repainting there is scope for that with great infrastructure spending that is going to going to come about in years to come that will change the shift another shift that will happen is today from 75 70 to 75% proportion in decorative versus industrial, that will industrial proportion of 20 to 25 percent will significantly increase over a period of time. That's in a nutshell about the industry. But today I would like to talk about the frontiers of knowledge. And I have put on put down a few thoughts which I'll share across. Uh, and that is in lieu of the keynote speech that I was about to give in the second section. So please bear with me, I'll just share that with you now. The color, pigments, paints, coatings and construction chemicals industry stand at the forefront of creativity, innovation and progress. From the vibrant hues that brighten our surroundings to the protective coatings that preserve our infrastructure, these elements are integral to the fabric of our modern world. They bring life to our homes, vitality to our buildings, and functionality to our structures, as was pointed out by a guest of honor. At the heart of our celebration today lies an acknowledgement of the tireless efforts and remarkable achievements of the pioneers and visionaries who have dedicated their lives to advancing our understanding and application of colors, pigments, paints, coatings, and construction chemicals. It is through their unwavering commitment and relentless pursuit of excellence that we find ourselves at the frontier of knowledge in this dynamic and essential industry. The surface coating is one of the oldest industries, dating back some 20,000 years. Early humans who scraped out an existence living in caves recorded their legacy using the most important means of communicating, and that's decorating and protecting, and that is paint. They used materials such as carbon and metal oxides as pigments, and blood, milk, and the extrudates of plants for their vehicles. The journey of coatings from Noah's Ark, where pitch was used to waterproof the Ark, to the Egyptian experiments with pigments, and the Japanese development of unique lacquer technology is all well known to you. Today, paints or coating is no longer used for recording history and for ceremonial decoration, but is used in almost every facet of human life, as was mentioned by Mrs. Bhumkar. The value of an automobile would be greatly reduced if we did not have the sophisticated primer, surfaces, and top coats that adorn the vehicle. To understand the value of coating, one should not look at the cost of the coating relative to the value of the substrate covered. The cost of an offshore fire protecting coating is 1% of the total cost of a drilling platform it is applied on, but its importance is many, many fold. The fundamental significance of colors cannot be understated. They infuse our environment with beauty, evoke emotions, and communicate messages with, with, without words. The scientific exploration of colors and pigments from their origins in nature to their synthesis, from their origins in nature to their synthesis, synthesis in laboratories, 
has unlocked a world of possibilities for artistic expression, technological innovation and cultural exchange. Our understanding of color and pigment properties, interactions and application has expanded exponentially, paving the way for groundbreaking developments in the field as diverse as art, design, material science and digital technology. Furthermore, the evolution of paints, coatings and construction chemicals has revolutionized the way we protect, enhance and prolong the lifespan of our built environment. With a keen focus on durability, sustainability and performance, researchers and industry professionals have devised advanced formulations, novel application techniques and cutting edge solutions that have redefined the standards of quality and efficacy in architectural, industrial and protective coatings. These innovations have not only elevated the aesthetic appeal of our surroundings, but have also contributed to the longevity and resilience of our infrastructure, from skyscrapers to bridges, <coughs> from pipelines to maritime vessels. As we stand on the cusp of a new era of discovery and advancement in the realm of colors, pigments, paints, coatings and construction chemicals, it is incumbent upon us to embrace the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. The pursuit of innovation, sustainability and societal impact will be crucial in shaping the trajectory of this industry and steering it towards a future characterized by excellence and responsibility. <coughs> I'd just like to make two more points and then conclude the speech. In this context, it is vital for us to foster collaboration between academia, industry and government entities to fuel the engines of research, development and knowledge exchange. By nurturing interdisciplinary partnerships and supporting educational in initiatives, we can cultivate the next generation of scientists, engineers and innovators who will propel this field into uncharted territories of discovery and application. In parallel, digital revolution has opened up unprecedented avenues for creativity, efficiency and customization in the realm of colors, pigments, paints, coatings and construction chemicals. Through digital design tools, simulation software, additive manufacturing techniques and smart coatings, we are witnessing a convergence of traditional craftsmanship with cutting edge digital capabilities leading to a renaissance of possibilities and application in this dynamic industry. At the Paints and Coating Skill Council, we encourage a use of simulators for learning uh, how to apply by spray. So, the three most influencers, influences in, on our industry are energy, materials and regulations. The threat of energy and resource shortages will continue to force our industry to look at low energy processes. This will include metal treatment, better curing processes, which can be obtained with energy efficiency and a focus to develop and exploit the potential use of chemical energy in product design. Again, a point which was referred to by uh, Mrs. Priyambada Bhumkar. In closing, I urge every one of you to continue your pursuit of excellence to embrace innovation and sustainability and to champion the transformative potential of colors, pigments, paints, coatings and construction chemicals. Let us embark on this journey with a sense of shared purpose and a spirit of collaboration and a dedication to living, leaving behind a legacy of progress and impact for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Now I would come and introduce uh, Professor Bhagwat. Good morning, everyone. 
it's uh, nice to introduce my colleague. We call him Sunil. Professor Sunil Bhagwat is the director of Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Pune, and professor of chemical in at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. Earlier it was UDCT, now it is ICT, where he was earlier the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering and then Dean of Academic Programs. His area of specialization is interfacial science, artificial neutral networks, energy and energy engineering. His group, over 40 doctoral students completed and 80 masters has successfully completed several research projects funded by the government agencies and private companies in India and abroad. His group won NOSIL award of IICHE in 212 by the Air Asia award HVAC in 2013, Science Academy, INSA teacher award in 2016 and UDCT Alumni Association Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2019. He was bestowed upon these all awards. He is a fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Science and Engineering in 2023. He is also an active consultant in many chemical industries. He has over 100 international publications and over 80 national and international conferences, presentations, and 10 patents to his credit. He has guided over 45 PhD and 85 master's students in chemistry and chemical engineering. Let me present to you my friend, Professor Sunil Bhagwat. Thank you, Professor Shanai, for that nice introduction. Uh, Acharya ji, Ms. Priya Bhumkar, other dignitaries on the dais, dignitaries off the dais, various stalwarts of the paints and coating technology industry and students of the paints and coating technology industry. Very good morning to you all. Welcome to this uh, campus of Science Education and Research Institute. Some of you know me as the person from ICT, it's been now less than a year, but that I am in this institute, so I am welcoming you here. And if you look at the theme, Frontiers of Knowledge, what comes to my mind is that paints and coatings, as Mukha Ma'am rightly said, has been probably last 50 years or more manufactured by various companies. Now, when it comes to continuing with the existing technology, or getting a technology from elsewhere and implementing it, MSME will be able to do it. But when it comes to testing the frontiers, developing something new, it usually then becomes the responsibility of larger industries in that domain. If you look at what it takes to make a paint and to make a paint successful, it involves the surface treatment, it involves making the polymer, it make, involves the polymerization, it involves the understanding of the copolymers, it involves the understanding of the copolymer mathematics, that co chain distributions that you would have. It involves dispersion of the particulate matter in it, it involves chemistry, it involves physics to understand 
how this paint when applied to a ship will prevent barnacles from attaching to it, it also involves biology. But very often what happens is that we and I include myself in that although I am not from the paint technology field, we engineers and technologists who make products and take pride in operating our industrial operations, very often ignore the fact that if you look at when did this product first came into existence for mankind in the form that we are seeing it today, there is a huge role that science has played. If you look at how the paint coating must be covering all the surface, you have to talk about the contact angle. If you want to say that the paint should remain stable over a certain period, you have to talk about the dispersion stability. The polymer which is going to be present in that, the binders which is present in the interactions of that, all of that involve fundamental science. But unfortunately, and this is one uh, complaint I have, is that the technologists who use it understand the value in it and create value for the society out of that. But they may not be the best people to look at the fundamental part of it. And when you talk to the fundamental science people, and again I include myself in that side as well, we sit in our ivory tower, we do something for our scientific pleasure and we are very happy doing scientific publications out of it. Never thinking in terms of is it really contributing to making something better for the society, for the industry, for a product. Now, if this happens both ways that the technology and the industries keep functioning in a way which they understand the best, the business part of it and scientists keeps functioning independently taking things in the direction that they like, whose responsibility it is to bring them both together and have a dialogue. How many times our technology product companies involve basic science people to the level of what the product requires to be made and how many times our scientists are willing to go to the level of a product when it comes to their basic science understanding. Now, unless we drop both these barriers and we bring them together in fora like this or in any other manner that you deem fit, we will not have the next generation of products as you were say, suggesting. Not even with the large companies that do this very often. Now, I see here in audience people from surfactant industries, but as far as paint industry is considered, they, uh, they will be talked about as peripherals, suppliers of an ingredient, right. So, similarly, there is an ingredient which is very important in that product called the science of it. So, why do not we give it the same importance that it needs to be given if we want the next level of development to come from it. It is from this perspective that I wanted an event of this kind to be brought to an institute here which is extremely good in its fundamental science work. ISER Pune is considered one of the top science institutions in the country, but if you ask me how many of them will be connected with any of the paint industries, the answer will be 0. If you ask so many of the paint industries, how many of them are connected? Now, UDCT is a class apart situation that they are involved in technology of it. But when you talk about how many of these industries are connected with somebody in basic science who understands maybe one aspect of it and can make it better, the answer is probably very little. And I think if such a meeting like today, if it causes that initiation of the dialogue between the two sides also I might say, the science people and the technology people. I think our organization of this meeting, I would call it a success today. So, with this once again, let me take leave from you and uh, 
welcome to this program and wish you all a very successful and very fruitful and enjoyable two days on our campus. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Harish Agarwal. Well said. To we are uh, moving towards surface coating society's special awards for today i would like to call upon uh, professor shenoy to introduce uh, dr pa prakash pathari It's nice to introduce uh, Dr. Prakash Patare, Director, Major Chemicals Private Limited. He is PhD from IIT Mumbai. He has, he has been in industry for 50 years, having worked in pharmaceutical yes. Dr. Prakash. Yeah, this is citation. Citation, no, citation is there. different. That is not called. No, this is introduction. Just introduction. No, no, go. Can we call Mrs. Patare? Yeah. May I invite Mrs. Patare on the dais? So, Dr. Prakash Patare was a PhD doctoral student from IIT Mumbai. He has been in, in industry for 50 years, having worked in pharmaceutical, petrochemical, foundry, construction chemicals, and in Asian Paints, Resins and Plastics Limited. Also worked in Europe and for some period. He was earlier known as the father of polyurethane coating technology in India, having introduced PU coatings as also the first aqueous two components epoxy coatings in 1984-85. Introduced airworthy PU coatings for India's combat aircrafts projects in 1988-89. The project was assigned to him by none but Sir APJ Abdul Kalam as then director of DRDO, and with whom he had pleasant personal working experience and the proud memories. The achievement of developing airworthy PU coatings for uh, fighter aircrafts, meeting very stringent requirements on it, was officially certified by Dr. Kalam in 1993 after its rigorous testing carried out for the over two years. Dr. Patare was also one of the experts for probing the cause of Bhopal accident, which took place in 1989. He has been working in the field of biocides for over 40 years, now having done many original contributions to the subject of taking global patents on his name. He has presented more than 80 lectures in the span of 50 years in the industry. He is promoting his newer theory in individual psychology in some circles. He is known as the artist, having had exhibitions of his paintings and having sold for uh, also. So these are, I think, his uh, extra or curricular activities. In April 2017, he suffered a very badly while in international flight with a group of members leading to cardiac arrest in death, but was somehow revived. He holds a major handicap today due to such incidents. In medical terms, he became five years old in April 10, 2022, after the said rebirth 
in April 2017. So I this is a background of uh, Dr. Prakash for us. You know, in Marathi, we call any Swargal sa dar tota una lele. I would like to call upon Ms. Priya Bhumkar to read out the citation for uh, Dr. Pathare. Sir, I will read it for you. Please come. Yes. <laughs> It's an honor to read the citation for Dr. Pathare. I have known him for many, many years. He was a very close friend of my father-in-law's again. And very stellar work in the industry for so many years. And great contribution uh, from your side, sir. I'm very happy to read the citation. Perhaps part of it or much of it has been covered, but I would still like to read all of it again. The citation says, Dr. Prakash Pathare, PhD from IIT Bombay. Presently, he is director at Melzer Chemicals Private Limited, Pune, but he is based in Mumbai. He has been in the industry for over 51 years without a break and having worked in pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, foundry chemicals, construction chemicals, paints, and resins with companies such as Boringer Knoll, Hardelia, Foseco, Foss Rock, Asian Paints, and RPL. He has worked in Europe for some period. He is highly regarded in the industry for his foresight and vision, inventions, his leadership qualities, as also his administrative skills in running the industry and his commitments towards achieving excellence in his field. While running his industry for the first about 23 years, his fields of operations were surface active agents, including EO condensates, personal care products, industrial antioxidants and corrosion inhibitors, polyurethanes, and biocides. He soon got recognition as the father of polyurethane coating technology in India, having introduced PU coatings as also the first aqueous two-component epoxy coating in the year 1984 and 85. He was instrumental to introduce polyurethane coatings on railway coaches as per design and specifications, which has become the RDSO and also the BIS specifications later. Wow. Thereafter, Director General of Roads and Bridges, Ministry of Roads and Transport decided that all bridges need to be coated by high-performance high corrosion-resistant coatings due to three main bridges in India, <coughs> causing great concern by the uncontrollable corrosion and the fast deterioration observed on them. As first action to protect them as much as possible, aqueous two-component epoxy was used for the first time on these bridges. Later, protective coatings on every new bridge became mandatory. Due to his experience in PU and handling of isocyanates, Dr. Pathare was also one of the experts for probing the cause of the Bhopal accident, which took place in December 1989. He introduced airworthy PU coating for India's light combat aircraft project in 88 and 89. Such coating used to get imported in our country. This project was assigned to him by none other than Sir APJ Abdul Kalam as the then director of DRDO organizations and with whom he held pleasant personal working experience and proud memories. The achievement of developing airworthy PU coating for fighter aircraft, meeting very stringent requirements on it as per US military specifications, was officially certified by Dr. Kalam in 1993 after having undergone very rigorous tests for over two years. He has been working in the field of biocides, antimicrobials for over 43 years now, and that's how I have known him more. During this span, he made many original contributions to the subject, and he holds a few global patents too. His work for antimicrobial for paint industry won him global recognition as also put Melzer very high on global technical leadership position. He has presented more than 80 lectures in a span of his last 50 years in the industry. He holds diverse interests and studies from those 
he postulated his newer theory in individual psychology which he feels can provide a few answers on personality issues and conflicts it would be great to talk to you about this also dr patare a few stunning results have been verified from the actual field of work he proposes to devote more time to this subject thereafter in some circles he is known as an artist having held exhibitions of his paintings very multifaceted personality indeed in april 2017 he suffered this part you already heard so i'll not repeat this part because we have him here with us and in token thereof and recognition and appreciation what sir thank you so much ma'am i would like to call upon professor bhagwat to present the citation to uh, dr pathare very special thanks to mrs pathare thank you so much very very difficult to speak on such occasions although i have been speaker for several years maybe today i am giving the 96th lecture of mine in the evening but uh, let me take the pleasure of uh, giving my very exclusive heartfelt thanks to everybody thanks to surface coating society for giving me the honor i only hope that it is not a suggestion from you to me to retire the generally such awards actually give the size of that kind anyway i'll be available always i also thank this august gathering today for uh, uh, the uh, involvement today towards the celebrations of knowledge i have been working for almost 52 years i completed 52 years in october 2023 in industry and it was a wonderful experience working with certain aims all throughout on this course i met with lot of dis disappointments lot of failures a little bit of success in which there were many participants with me all the failures all the disappointments disappointments are basically originating from me the success is from all coming together so uh, this was a wonderful journey no doubt <laughs> coming to specifics it's very difficult to maintain a person like me but my wife dr gauri although she is a professional she uh, 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 managing patients she could manage so my <clears throat> so my thanks to her i owe to my father he was a civil engineer from vcti 1923 batch who worked as a civil engineer for 60 years and 7 months which is a guinness books of world record which is unbroken till today i i come to 52 years he was already 60 years and 7 months and we made him retire at the age of 88 because he didn't look like 88 and he kept on working so on this occasion i do remember him and i do feel that okay the blessings are coming from them i cannot forget my two children one of my child i mean my son is a student of professor bhagwat from university he did his chemical engineering in 2004 2005 and did purdue i mean did phd from purdue today my children teach me a lot and wonderfully they have been further assisted by my grandchildren right 
So they know that this gentleman doesn't know many things. So they have been keeping me completely fresh with the new technologies, with the new world, which is very difficult for people like us to really realize, especially from all the corners of the world. So I'm rather happy to have such children and grandchildren around. Although they stay far away from us, they are in the US, but we talk to them quite often, and uh, that is a great pleasure. I cannot forget my teachers. We in IIT has got a absolutely different kind of a bondage with the teachers. Let me tell you, just about four years back, when I was stuck up with uh, one subject, I approached my 86-year-old teacher, and he worked out the complete mathematics for that, and he gave me the solution. We sat for three days at his residence. At the end of it, he tells me not to mention, not to include his name in the patent, which I filed. These are our teachers. So we owe them quite a lot. I had a wonderful experience working with Sir APJ Abdul Kalam when we used to sit like this together, discuss, discuss, and discuss because it was a airworthy coating which was to be done. The project had gone through many in industries and finally it came to me only because I was known uh, for, for the polyurethane. The coating was getting imported from France and uh, uh, UK, I mean USA only two companies manufacturing it. And the light combat aircraft project was already signed as a necessity. That light combat aircraft actually flew somewhere in the year 2005, 2006. But the work was being done in 2088 to 2092. I finished that project in about 18 months, which even the American scientists could not realize. It was tested for almost about two, two and a half years because uh, when this combat aircraft fly, within about 30, to 30 seconds to one minute, temperature difference is something like a 70 degrees and plus. Too many vibrations, they keep on dropping the heights, so there is a, 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 a quite likely pill off of the entire coating. The aircraft will come down to the earth as bare metal. Secondly, this aircraft has got uh, many uh, materials of construction, including fiberglass. There were antennas. There are uh, almost about 36 antennas on such co combat aircraft. So the coating has to transmit the signals. But at the same time, I was told that certain signals should not be transferred, should not be transmit, uh, transmitted. So there have to be special effects to be already incorporated into the paint. It was quite a tough job because there is uh, everything is coated together. Not that antennas are getting coated separately and aircraft body is getting uh, coated separately. It never happened. The aircraft body is also the multi, uh, uh, I would say the, uh, aluminum plus the alloys and all kind of thing. They want to reduce the weight completely. So it was quite a difficult job, but uh, everything became possible because of Sir APJ Abdul Kalam. I did not meet him thereafter when he became president, obviously because the industry will be watching me. Why did I go and meet president? So I awarded that, right? But uh, yes, he was a person who always kept contact and always realized what is what. Another beautiful phase in my life, I lived with two army men. Entirely different story altogether. One was Parambir Chakra holder, R.R. Rane, the only Parambir Chakra holder who was alive at that particular time. A completely different man. You just can't imagine what the mental frame of that person is. He was a, such a discipline in that we used to get frightened. But he used to call me as Patsy. And uh, later on, I learned what the discipline really means and what the honor towards the nation really means. The second gentleman was my temporary landlord. I said temporary because I was a temporary man. He was a permanent man uh, in Germany. 
he was also a, 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 from the army much later i happened to know that he retired actually from the hitler's army which never never revealed but i saw him one day crying crying and crying where we were in the jungle and then he told me that what he had to undergo right but these two people really changed the entire perspective towards the life so these are the some of the beautiful moments lastly i have to come to my colleagues there is one lady sitting over here shiva she has been working with me for the last 28 years so my crazy ideas were translated into reality by her hand holding with her juniors to complete the things which i have been noticing quite often so i thank all my colleagues and i am sure that we can continue in the same way here after in the end this journey was beautiful this journey was difficult i got the extension of 6 years already i am enjoying that maybe i enjoy something more and definitely i'll be meeting you again and again thank you for your presence today thank you very much thank you so much sir uh now i would like to uh actually call upon uh, ms priya bhumkar this is to give, introduce mr vinod mehra anupam colors and uh, this will be a industry excellence awards for this year i uh, i would like to call upon mrs mehra also uh, on the dais it's my honor to introduce uh, to you all one more eminent person from our industry today uh, and i'd like to share some information about him so to mr and mrs vinod mehra uh, i'll start with his educational qualifications uh, you want me to reveal your age sir <laughs> <laughs> he's 75 years it's written here he's 75 years old so lot of experience in the industry his educational qualification is he is bsc honors and bsc tech ppv ppv is polymers paints and varnishes from uricity in the year 1972 he's had a very long uh, working career he started his career with rishi roop polymers uh private limited uh and there he was working on the development of chlorinated rubber with tata chemicals in mithapur uh which is an important substitute for paints printing inks and additive industry and he was successfully commissioned the project on a commercial scale he worked on this between the years 1972 and 1975 right at the very start of his career in the next phase of his career he has been with asian paints where he has worked on the development of resins and several new projects for the company this was between the years 1975 and 1979 from 1979 to date the entrepreneurial bug bit him and he became an entrepreneur with his company as promoter and partner anupam colors and chemicals industry we all of us in the industry know this company today very famous industry has done lot of work 
for so many years and good contribution uh, from their side. Uh, this is a company which is engaged in the manufacturing of chrome pigments for paints, printing inks and plastic industries. In the year 2000, Anupam Colors uh, started to make both inorganic as well as organic pigments. He is prolifically involved in several other activities. He has a very active involvement with UDCT, where he was an examiner for three years for the BSc Tech course. Uh, he participated in several endowment lectures uh, at UDCT. He's been a recipient of the Distinguished Alumnus Entrepreneur Award of the UDCT Alumni Association, and he's been a fellow of the Color Society uh, oh, he also has won the award as Fellow of Color Society for in the year 2017. Uh, I think your industry is in Wapi, uh, Mr. Mehra. Therefore, he's been very actively involved with the Wapi Industries Association, where there are more than 800 uh, companies which are part of this association as in various roles. He has been associated with this association, the first as secretary, then as vice president, then as pre pre then as president. A lot of contribution in terms of being the founder director of the Wapi Waste and Effluent Management Company, which later became the Wapi Green Enviro. And he's been a board member with this company. Uh, after that, he's been on the regional advisory committee for Central Excise and Customs at Surat and Wapi. He's a founder member of Central Excellence, Center of Excellence, uh, having testing facilities to test pharmaceutical drugs, intermediates, pigments, paper, and other products. And then he has a keen interest in life in general. He's a keen tracker, and he has tracked extensively in the Garhwal and the Kumaon regions, Chandrata and the Gomukh areas. And he has uh, visited the Valley of Flowers. So his love for nature uh, is very evident from these pursuits of his. In token thereof, and, rec and in recognition and appreciation for outstanding vision, dedication, and commitment, the Surface Coating Society has duly resolved on this day of 1st December 2023 to bestow upon Sri Vinod Mehra the Industry Excellence Award. Let us all give him a clap. Congratulations to you also, Mrs. Mehra, for all your sat sangat with this gentleman. I would like to call um, Professor Bhagwat. Uh, please, please. I'll take a picture. I'll take a picture. No. Later on. We'll, we'll, we'll call those girls to take the picture. Thank you, dignitaries, and so congratulations. Before response of uh, my friend uh, Vinod, something I have to reveal, which he also may not know. So this is my privilege and honor 
to congratulate him for this award. To tell you all, you might have seen from his uh, citation, he has done BSc and then BSc Tech. That was from UDCT. BSc Tech course was of three years after BSc with Chemistry in Honours. So, we were classmates in uh, UDCT for three years. And each year, in special subjects, there were practicals. First year was totally dedicated for raw material analysis, functional group analysis, etc., which are used in the total coating systems. The third year was dedicated for preparation analysis related to the binders used in coatings. And I know, and I feel all of you know also, that most of the binders used in coatings, they are thermosetting types. Means what? While preparation, there is always danger of their gelation. And gelation means the product has lost. And in second year, total special subject was dedicated for pigment preparation, pigment analysis, their determination, etc., etc. So in the second year, when the pigment experiments were carried out, every time, there was a smile and happiness in the face of one of the student. You know, all the time. Because in the second year, we used to also observe the trend in the preparation of resins, what is happening afterwards. And many of the our seniors used to get disturbed and disheartened so that their reactions are gelled. You might have known about butylated urea formaldehyde, short oil alkyd resins. Many of these experiments used to get gelled and we lose or we get disheartened. This we saw in the second year. So, this was brought to me, to my notice, by one of our other classmates. Unfortunately, he is not with us, but he silently told me, you see the face of Vinod, always coming smiling after preparation or synthesis of pigment was done. So, I just ignored it at that time because we were young, thought of this might be some, you know, for joke he is talking about. Then we met in Wapi in one of their colleagues' meeting normally on Wednesday evening. And at that time, you all three were together. He reminded me that, do you remember, I told you that a person gets coming laughing, charming face after completion of pigment synthesis? I said, yes, I do remember. That fellow is nothing but Vinod Mehra. Why I told you this small clipping is, there is a kaavat in Hindi. Honar bilwan ke hot chikne paat. Am I right? That meaning we came to know later, and that meaning is described by Vinod, which I wanted to place before you. So, my friends, you can see the liking of the subject right in the early age, and pursuing that subject with dedication till today is one such example in front of us. So, friends, I wish him First is a congratulation for his uh, award. It's my privilege and honor to tell him. And second part is to give his life, strength, everything with the support of his family and Kanchan Babiji. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello. Hello. Thank you, everybody. First, to thank Surface Coating Society and the members of the committee, those who
thought to give this award to me and then to all of you, those who have wished me for this purpose. Now, these type of awards or this type of small thing happening in the life do not come without any grace, without any happiness or without any blessings. I remember my blessings that started the day one when I started in UDCT, the first day for the applications were made. Of course, I was selected in the second list. Subject was given, you know, topic was this PPV for my studies. After attending three years in Bhavan's College and then see those type of buildings, moment I enter the first day with that letter for that admission, that was a wonderful time to see the buildings of that type, of that type of education centers, which I have never seen. The, the architect of the building, the lobby, the splendid laboratories, that was fascinating and the whole paradigm shift of the education for me, the change the day I entered there. Of course, the last, next three years went as Mohan said so many things about me, thanks to him quite a lot. Uh, the things came, you know, finally the whole culture in the UDCT, the whole, the type of education, the way of education or way of learning was totally a different concept, totally different concept, which was not known to earlier to me. Then uh, the final one most important thing came up in the last day of my exam. We were in the first floor. Moment you go to the first floor, I think there are many from UDC, they know it. When you go to the first floor, left side is the offices, right side is the, the, the classrooms. I was in the second classroom writing our exam in the second half, two to four, two to five. Maybe last about 15 or 20 minutes, someone banged the road and somebody came in. You know, the room was of course slightly lit and then we saw at that time Professor Daruwala, the then director. He entered the room, he says, friends and my students, please stop writing. No, it was, a, it was very shocking, you know, immediately, suddenly the director coming and saying something, what has happened? Then he said, wait, I'll take about 8 to 10 minutes to talk to you and then I'll give you 12 minutes additional to write your paper, don't worry about that. The very first sentence, Pomendi came near the center of us. He said, first one thing I assure you, you are all going to pass. <laughs> now, now imagine a director level person is telling totally at outright said, you are all going to pass. And uh, he suddenly came into the mind, see the person, personality, his conviction, his thought process, his trust and his confidence in his student that no one will fail. He never used the word fail. He said, you will all pass. That was very good. After that, then he said the second thing. One week, please take a leave from tomorrow. After one week, come down to the college uh, in the corridor on the notice board. You just see in your sections, what are the companies? Choose the company where you want a job. And some of them, may might come back for the studies and some of you might like go for a job. Please select your company where you want a job. This is how, this is the institution, you know, you know, you, you cannot, I, I don't have any experience of any other institution where a director is talking like this. You are going to pass and choose a company where you want a job of your liking. This is what exactly happened. Please trust me. This I am talking in science 72 when we passed out. Of course, I could not go for further studies so due to some reasons. Selected the company, so job, the thing. No, this is the institution. I take, I, when I said the blessing the very first day and the blessing on the last day, this is what it came to. Now, all these things, all these things are due to those blessings only where I stand today in a very, very small and tiny way. What I have done, what we have created it in a very small way, we are doing it. Of course, the blessings never complete without parents' blessings. Parents are always there. They always bless you. And then comes the family. 
the first companion and the children are all grown up they are so supportive all these years of today almost completed 52 years of working in this industry as a part of my job and a part of my industry and uh, to be we are in the 45th year of our anupam colors private limited we are doing this part of this and uh, as i somebody said that you know the subject uh, celebration of frontier of knowledge but well, tell you today I started my company as a chrome pigment and i please trust me till today chrome pigment is under still the development part the application is still challenging the applications are coming the most difficult challenge came in 1990s 89 90s the use of chrome pigments in plastic industry at that time it was not being used absolutely and it was a challenge and uh, since i was traveling continuously commuting between bombay and wapi in the train uh, i would like to name that person mr kabra from plasti blend industries the md of the company suddenly asked what are you doing i said i have a pigment industry i have a plastic industry which pigment i said this pigment please come tomorrow we'll want to talk to you this is how the process of using chrome pigments in plastic industry started for industrial application he is very is a very different nature of person very uh, he made it a point that i will not use it in any other place only for the industrial application i will use this pigment this is how the development started it took close to around but 4 years to standardize the pigment for the other way all these years we were producing for the paint industry is going not much of a complaint thing is okay somewhere light fastenings somewhere uh, uv all these things but plastic industry the things took place at turn this is how the thing started out as i said the development never stops even today there is a challenge to improve on these pigments also but still the work is going on and i tell you daily there are two small batches of 500 grams in the laboratory all the working on these pigments only either in the surface uh, surface treatment or in the dispersion or in the processes because we have to look for the, uh, for the you know in pigment industry we use lot of water and we feel sometime yes it is there is extra water which is going on now to reduce that water these batches are being taken per kg reduction per kg reduction of this water not only the water the power these two elements are being reduced to a larger extent just to quote your figure that at one stage at at one stage we were using close to about 150 liters of water per kg and today you will surprise it is less than 20 liters this is what has the change taken place and it's all due to the challenge challenge from the industry to improve the products challenge the industries to make this pigment workable for this and the challenge from within challenge from that the water which is being used i cannot use it you have to reduce it out this is what is today but it is a small part of it so many things has happened at the end i only thank everybody all of your your good wishes your praising me whatever your word you have said i thank you everybody and from my heart to all of you i love you like you and respect you thank you so much mr mehra and congratulations to you yes um i would like to call upon um dr okay thank you sir because of some emergency a uh, professor bhagwat has to leave so he has leave now see as far as the chrome pigment is concerned just mera was uh, uh, mr mera was talking and now see in chemical analysis suppose you take a lead nitrate and uh, mix it with the chromate solution take sodium chromate and mix it you will find a precipitate yellow color precipitate that precipitate is not the lead chrome if you heat it in water it leaches out you have to give many different type of coatings to the lead chromate to stabilize it it will improve the dispersion by giving coatings 
different kind of alumina coating different kind of silicate coating so many coatings are there those coatings are applied then only you will get the pigmentary properties otherwise you are not going to get the pigmentary properties so it looks very simple but it's not that simple it is very tricky product so stabilization of chrome pigments are very stable now uh, our uh, chief guest is not there i'll request uh, two important uh, announcement i request uh, professor uh, mr jagdish acharya to present two awards please come jagdish acharya ji dr ravi kulkarni you are requested to come on the dais good afternoon i am i come from the industry of, of of specialty chemicals and that's actually silicones silicones and um, surface coating industry how does it uh, relate to so if you look at it uh, silicones 80 per 85% of the silicones are used in the surface modifications and surface modification is a very fundamental and basic to the surface coatings as uh, uh mrs bumkar was saying was saying that uh, everything is a surface and everything uh, and surfaces don't use, are not used as is they are actually modified and when you modify they become more friendly to the environment where they are and therefore they are, they become more lasting and silicon happens to be the compound and there is a lot more discussion to be done and i think afternoon uh, lk chemical is going to give a talk on silicon so you will have a lot more information but i think the uh, silicon industry has been around for last 80 years and in 80 years i have seen and, and, and out of those 50 years i have been in that industry okay and uh, this industry is very exciting and the marriage of silicon with the uh, surface coatings is going to bring unprecedented new level of products and concepts including the performance uh, surfaces which is what you are talking about that that functionality okay uh you want to have surfaces which are uh, interbacterial for example uh, surfaces which will actually will continue to interact with the lighting special lighting around to give you specific properties okay so those are like and their um, silicons will can play a very very important role basically so i feel that um, even though i don't come from the surface coating industry uh, i feel very much part of it because of the silicons uh evolution of silicon the first product which was which i was involved with in 60s late 60s or in, in early 70s was the deformer and as you know i think the most of you probably are very familiar with the deformer concept and those are the first time developed during the early 70s time frame subsequently silicon surfactants silicon surfactants also has a revolutionary impact um on uh, whether you talk about surface coating or we talk about whether you talk about construction or even the agriculture a tremendous amount of impact and these industries are growing very rapidly uh, generally the silicon industry is growing in india at about probably about 14 to 15% per year so it's a very very fast growing industry and uh, today we are about uh, still a small industry it's about 4 5 5000 crore rupees industry in india but globally it is a 20 billion dollar india is playing a very important role in the global market in developing specialty products and therefore the specialty uh, coatings and i feel that this society which you just talked about here has a very important role in play in uh, in bringing india on the mainstream exports and mainstream uh, specialty product developments i feel that that uh, personally i don't know particularly specifically about surface uh, industry but overall india has a huge network of medium size industries which have tremendous technology 
very, very outstanding technology. And what I've just heard about Boomkar, you guys have tremendous amount of industrial technology, and this technology has is uh, disproportionately used in India, and not as much as uh, in the global market. I challenged the surface uh, coating industry uh, to um, double up and and uh, and get this uh, globalized technology. What do you have? You might be using this for the last 50 years, but I think the, there may be a lot more novelty which you have, which I think uh, global market may need. And my my challenge to the industry is that let us bring this, uh, our, let us globalize what you have. And if you globalize it, it's going to have a tremendous implication to the global market. Okay, so I want to thank you for giving me the um, honor here to be here. And uh, we would like to work with our uh, surface uh, industry as well as with ICER in, um, in integrating silicon technology to various applications such as construction, surface coating, agriculture, and, um, and personal care industry. Thank you very much. One more special award, Mr. Jeet Malhotra, please come on the dais. Professor Nirmaya Ballav, so, Pro Professor Nirmaya Ballav, please come to the dais. A very good afternoon to everybody. I think uh, I am very honored to receive this award. I am far too young sitting between all the stalwarts of this industry to comment more on, on those subjects. But it is an honor to receive this award, and thank you very much. So I am, I am from uh, Sunshield Chemicals Limited. I am the managing director. And uh, we are a manufacturer of surfactants. So we do uh, surfactants of various hydrophobes, whether it is alkyl phenol or fatty alcohols, synthetic alcohols and others. We have been uh, major suppliers to large uh, paint manufacturers like Asian Paints. And uh, we are growing in this segment. We have a good uh, presence. And uh, we, we want to you know, develop new products, futuristic products for the industry. Looking forward to you know discussing and networking with all of you all, and uh, I mean developing new products for uh, for the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to call uh, Dr. Jagdish Acharya to come forward, please. Can I call Mrs. Pathare, please, on the dais to felicitate Ms. Uh, Priya Bhumkar?
पावर भी रखते प्रोफेसर वल्लभ गुप्ता प्रोफेसर वल्लभ प्लीज I would like to call upon Dr. Singh to give the vote of thanks. Well, the morning session of uh, inauguration is coming to an end. It's my duty now to give a vote of thanks to everybody or the person who was involved to make it successful. The first thing goes to the first uh, thank goes to the institute itself. Mr. Naramalai Vallabh is also a part of that. Dr. Sunil Bhagavad has just uh, left, as you see. Their support has been really good. And uh, people working at the working level also, they have been very supportive and cooperative. They have a lot of facilities, of course, which we have used. And uh, it was wonderful stay over here for the last three, four days and working with these people and making all the arrangement. Next, all the stalls and this thing, arrangement which has been done, there also we have to appreciate all the efforts made by them. Then our committee members working at the desk, reception, sitting on the desk, and special thanks to our <laughs> Dr. Agarwal, all the things have been done by him, really, really, really in a very short time, all the efforts made by him to contact most of the sponsors, and is really a personal uh, experience and personal uh, words, uh, actions. Wonderful job he has done. And uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, other activities also. And uh, Mr. Uh, we call him Sharma Ji. He has also done a equally good job along with Mr. Uh, Dr. Agarwal. And last thing, our uh, staff people who have been wonderfully working all this along. And Last, not the least, all audience. We have come here all from Bombay, Surat, Wapi, and uh, Pune itself. I really have a very, very special thanks for you to join us and uh, making a successful function. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now there is one uh, special announcement. Uh, we have an exhibition over there. I would like to call all the guests to inaugurate the exhibition and uh, all the guests to please join us for the inauguration of the exhibition, please. It's on the other, other hall, but we'll have to go from the outside.
தெரியல <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
20 microns was founded in 1987 to manufacture white industrial and by introducing the concept of industrialization in India. 20 microns was launched with vision through continued leadership and engaged employees, which made us India's largest producer of white industrial minerals, offering innovative products in the field of functional fillers, extenders, and specialty chemicals, empowering our clients with customized products of exceptional quality. Driven by core business ethics, propelled by excellence and innovation, with the best manufacturing practices and state-of-the-art R&D center, we have a strong presence in more than 50 countries across the globe to a cross-section of industries. 20 microns now has global footprints with its subsidiaries in Malaysia, Sharjah, and Vietnam. Our enhanced and impressive portfolio of products, bridging the concept of mining to micronizing and sub-micronizing to nanosizing, has helped us produce innovative and functional high-performance extenders and specialty additives for paints and coatings, plastics and polymers, paper and rubber applications, ceramics, oil well drilling, foundry, construction, agrochemical, cosmetic, adhesive, printing ink, and many such allied industries enriching our everyday life. Twenty Microns was founded in 1987 to manufacture white industrial minerals by introducing the concept of micronization in India. Twenty Microns has been ardently pursuing its vision through continued leadership and its dedicated employees which made us India's largest producer of white industrial minerals, offering innovative products in the field of functional fillers, extenders and specialty chemicals, empowering our clients with customized products of exceptional quality.
driven by core business ethics, propelled by excellence and innovation, with the best manufacturing practices and state-of-the-art R&D center, we have a strong presence in more than 50 countries across the globe to a cross-section of industries. 20 Microns now has global footprints with its subsidiaries in Malaysia, Sharjah and Vietnam. Our enhanced and impressive portfolio of products, bridging the concept of mining to micronizing and sub-micronizing to nanosizing, has helped us produce innovative and functional high-performance extenders and speciality additives for paints and coatings, plastics and polymers, paper and rubber applications, ceramics, oil well drilling, foundry, construction, agrochemical, cosmetic, adhesive, printing ink, and many such allied industries enriching our everyday life. Welcome back to our next session. May I call upon Mr. Vinod Mehra to chair this session, please? And I would like to call Mr. Himang Patel as well. Welcome, Dr. Himang Patel. Uh, I would like you to please introduce yourself a few, just in few sentences. Yes, I am Himang Patel, founder and I am responsible for new product and business development over here. And I have total 15 years of experience in inorganic extendants and minerals. So should I start? So, very good afternoon. Thank you for coming here today. I would like to thank you organizing committee, Surface Coating Society and sponsor for providing me very good facility for this presentation. I am looking forward to talking with you, optimizing paints and coating formulation with industrial functional extenders. So we can draw inspiration from this quote. There is a plenty of room at the bottom provided by Professor Richard Fiarman. So in 1959, he had delivered a lecture and in his lecture, he told that in future, scientists can able to develop and manipulate individual atoms and the molecules. And later decay, Professor Norio Tanaguchi has given the term nanotechnology. So according to nanotechnology, it is a microscopic particle having one dimension less than 100 nanometer. So question rise in mind that what about the other particles which does not have one dimension less than 100 nanometer. Then they are term as microns, submicrons, ultrafine microns materials. So as a 20 microns 
we are continuously developing and modifying the minerals which will be helpful for the different different paint industries so you can see over here in this video that how much nano they have provided and comparison of earth versus galaxy so 20 micron is an umbrella group and under umbrella group we have 20 micron nano 20 micron sdn bhd 20 micron fzd 20 micron vietnam and 20 micron mcc basically it is a construction company and also we have 20 minford it is basically 100% plant growth promoter company so in india we have total 9 manufacturing plant and out of india we have total 2 uh, manufacturing units so i just skip these slides we have very good r&d facility center located at wagodia vadodara gujarat in gujarat we have two r&d centers and for the measurement of various chemical and physical properties we have sophisticated instruments and we also have paint application center so before providing any grade to customer we first check its paints property and then we provide our grades to customers so these are the topic of the today's uh, presentations so we have basic industrial extenders function of extenders in paints and coatings and their most important parameters and benefit of industrial extenders in paint and coating and then conclusions so you can see over here calcium carbonate talc mica hydrous kaolin calcium kaolin these are the basic industrial extenders it has been utilized since many years in paints and coating industries and this is the basic composition of the paint that binder solvent pigment filler and additive so here my main concentration is for pigment and filler so there are three scientists there were three scientists lau nipik and fendrick they have studied the crystal structure of the zinc sulfide and copper sulfate they put zinc sulfide and copper sulfate into x ray beam and they have found the dis different discretion of diffraction and from that they create a hypothesis of the atoms on in molecules so there are three types of uh, fillers normal fillers functional fillers and multifunctional fillers so normal fillers they have particle size average particle size around 20 microns functional fillers they have average particle size around 10 to 2 microns and multifunctional fillers they have less than 1 microns so this is also most important mo hardness scale so talc is the softest material and you can see diamond is the hardest material but in the paint we can limit up to seven means quartz quartz is uh, seven hardness so if i have to prepare a paint which provides very good weather resistance and anti sagging property then i can consider the talc talc is a hydrophobic material and it provides very good anti sagging property when you utilize in your paint formulation at the same time if i have to think that my paint should provides very good scratch resistance scrub resistance then i have to utilize quartz material for my paint so these are general uh, refractive indices of the various pigments and fillers so you can see over here that uh, tio2 has a maximum refractive index while other fillers and pigments they have similar to the resolution most important when you determine or when you are going to prepare a paint so you can see over here that block type uh, calcium carbonate is blocky sometime it has a spherical structure also uh, acacular atapulgite or wollastonite calcium silicate it has acacular structure and platy in case of hydrous kaolin calcium kaolin talc mica they have a platy structure now aspect ratio is the most important when you determine or where you prepare the paints so aspect ratio in needle is the ratio of mean length to diameter while in case of platy structure it is mean diameter to thickness you can see over here its uh, thickness so this thickness is most important so this is the practical example when you prepared a paint you can consider this black portion is the paint film and this is the platy particle either you can consider talc mica kaolin 
so when they are aligned parallel to the paint film then it will minimize the oxygen and moisture permeation inside and by this way one can prepare a paint with very good weather resistance at the same time it i have a uh, wollastonite or calcium silicate it has a acicular type structure needle type structure or atapulgite it has also a needle type structure so when it align perpendicular to the paint film it will provides very good reinforcement with the paint film so such type of paint you can utilize in your uh, for intercoat applications so these are the most important parameter that what fillers provides it provides very good mechanical strength it provides filling effect so one can reduce the organic solvent it gives coating very good gloss and smoothness it provides very good weather resistance or so ir resistance and it provides very good flow in terms of rheology by replacing synthetic organic additives so for the preparation of paint i have to consider this point it has a very good particle size uh, distribution is the narrow it will be easy disperse and coating can be can be completely and uniformly covered and it has a low oil absorption if it is a low oil absorption i can add more in my paint formulations and also it provides very good thickening and leveling effect so these are the uh, basic that paint has been categorized solvent based water based and powder coating powder coating is 100% powder and in water based paint i have mentioned some of the exterior and interior paint and also in types of solvent based paint i have mentioned some of the popular paint so these are the some approximate data of the percentage pigment loading or you one can say that how much filler one can load in texture paint in chip acrylic emulsion in 100% acrylic emulsion and in elastomeric coating and these are the data for the interior paint so you can see over here there is a amount maximum amount of the fillers in this type of paint so now one very good things is that basic process how 20 microns will generate or micronize the minerals and this is most important so you can see over here that we have various technique like ball mill pin mill hammer mill and the jet mill various process will provides various output various particle size distribution if i will provide you calcium carbonate powder from the ball mill and from the jet mill and if you use that powder in your paint formulation definitely it will gives the different result in terms of gloss in terms of opacity so this technique is the most important and from that one can choose that i have to gain the close in my paint formulation then i will provide the calcium carbonate for the uh, from the jet milling and particle shape is also shape in terms of morphology it is also important i will explain in my upcoming slides uh this is hydras keolin plant so this is the exactly same plant we have at bhuj location we have our own mine also for the keolin you can see over here that we collect the raw materials of keolin mix it the water and some additives and after that you can see over here this is the blanching so we do two type of the blanching in order to collect the soft portion of the keolin very pure form of the keolin in order to reduce the respirable crystalline silica content and after that it passes to degrading unit so here in this degrading unit we maximize the concentration slurry concentration of the hydrous keolin and after that we have put uh, this is not mentioned over in this video we have put one five tesla magnet so using five tes
ये यस सर यस सर सो यूजिंग फाइव टेस्ला मैग्नेट वी रिमूव द मैक्सिमम मैग्नेटिक पैरा मैग्नेटिक इम्प्योरिटी ऑन ऑर्डर टू इंक्रीज द वाइटनेस ऑफ द केवोलिन एंड दिस इज द सेंट्री साइजर सो यूजिंग द सेंट्री साइजर वी रिड्यूस द पार्टिकल साइज ऑफ द केवोलिन एंड वॉश विद द फ्रेश वाटर सो यूजिंग फ्रेश वाटर एंड मैग्नेट इट्स वाइटनेस इज द इंक्रीजेस एंड आफ्टर दैट वी फिल्टर प्रेस दैट स्लरी एंड वी गेट द वेट केक ऑफ द केवोलिन एंड आफ्टर दैट वेट केक we dry in calciner either in dryer or either in sun dry so this is the washing part of the kaolin in sentry sizer and after that it will pass through the filter press we collected that slurry in the sump and after that you can see over here this is the uh, this portion is the filter press and you can see over here this white portion of the kaolin so this is for the hydrous kaolin plant and this is for the calcine kaolin plant how we calcine the material so you can see over here we use the wet cake after drying and also we can utilize direct lumps of the kaolin you can see over here and put it on the hopper and after that it will pulverize into the powder and after pulverization it will go into the calciner and the temperature of the calciner around 1000 to 1200 degree celsius so it will pass through the conveyor belt and after calciner we collect <coughs> the calcine kaolin material so what happen hydrous kaolin contain 14 molecule of the water molecule so it will release during at 950 degree celsius so due to this its whiteness is increases and when you utilize that calcine kaolin material in your paint formulation you will get the dry hiding so it will pass like this in centrifugal force it is rotating clean and then it will classify in classifier and after the classifier one can get very good fine powder of the calcine kaolin when you utilize calcine kaolin in your paint formulation it provides the matte type finish due to the whole structure gets collapse uh this is another most important technique of the spray dry technique so what we do we prepare a slurry and you can see ha so we prepare a slurry you can see over here we mix with the some additives and then slurry and you can see over here that we have one bigger tank in which hot gear is passes away and uh this is the spray dryer unit so in spray dryer we have uh certain sprinkler so using that sprinkler we can get the beads of the kaolin so when you utilize this uh kaolin beads you can load more amount of the beads in your paint formulations and also it will provides very good opacity and gloss in your paint formulation due to the softer nature and this is the classifier in which it classifies and after that we can pack in bags as per the requirement of the customers so now if i will ask what is your perception for the functional extenders so this perception is basically depends on paint manufacturer and person you are utilizing it as a raw material but as per my opinion it has a value so we have dr shrivastava sir over here so 
I have heard his uh, lecture. So he told uh, when he visited Germany museum, then he uh, saw the horse which is made up from quartz. So according to him, what is your specialization? So minerals are there, but what is unique specialization? So every day we are doing some specialization in minerals. So I will start with calcium carbonate and dolomite. So you can see over here that uh, calcium carbonate, it has a more hardness 3 and dolomite has around 3 to 3.5. So there is a one simple test when you add HCl or sulfuric acid that CO2 will be bubbled. So one can uh, easily get the idea of the uh, calcium carbonate and this calcium carbonate these are the different lumps of the calcium carbonate and dolomite lumps. So we segregate the whiter portion and after that we micronize it our plant. And most important you can see over here it is a surface morphology. You can see over here this surface uh, totally different in terms of the calcium carbonate and also dolomite it is also little bit different. But if you utilize calcium carbonate having the same purity, same particle size and if you utilize this, both provides different opacity versus different glows. Why? Because this surface, it is a little bit porous or little bit disturbs. It is not this smooth, while in this case, it uh, indicates it is a very smooth like Cadbury chocolates. So surface morphology plays also important role when you prepare a paint. Uh, so these are the various uh, data I have provided in exterior paint, in solvent paint, paint, interior paint. So calcium carbonate is such type of mineral it can utilize like potato. Potato utilize in every uh, vegetables. <laughs> so. Uh, I have prepared one uh, paint using calcium carbonate 1, calcium carbonate 2, calcium carbonate 3. You can see over here what is its property and how it is differ. And at the same time if I will utilize this calcium carbonate in paint formulation, uh, prepared economy mid PVC paint having percent with PVC 47. So you can see over here that drastic change in the gloss. Calcium carbonate 1, it provides 23 gloss. 2 provides 31 gloss and 3 provides 43 gloss and that is why this calcium carbonate has a value and that is why it is a costly material. We have created in plant very good setup if surface morphology of rough how we can make a smooth surface of various minerals. So same calcium carbonate it provides very good gloss at the same time provides matte effect at the sometimes provides very good rheology. So it depends how you are how you are creating or preparing or micronizing that individual minerals. Uh, another thing is hydrous and calcine kaolin. So you can see over here that for hydrous kaolin you can see that uh, in this uh, water you can clearly see this fish. While in case of uh, this bucket continuously added water, you cannot see clearly its bottom part. So this is the main mechanism hydrous versus the calcine. Hydrous provides semi gloss and gloss when you utilize in your paint formulation. But at the same time if you utilize calci uh, calcine kaolin, it provides the mat. It is the general formula in paint industries. So when you utilize hydrous kaolin, uh, gloss means whatever radiation come from the environment, they are reflected 100% in the specular reflection. But in case of calcine kaolin, it are uh, the rays has been diffused. Why it is diffused? Because it removes the 40% water molecule due to this whole structure of the kaolin gets disturbed. Disturb. And due to this, when you utilize in your paint formulation, it provides very good matte effect with dry hiding in your paint formulations. So this kaolin it has a more hardness 2.5 and this data I have already explained. So these are the lumps of the hydrous kaolin and you can see over here it is a platy structure 
and when you heat this material at 1200 degree Celsius, then it will create the porosity in structure. So, these are the approx data that I have provided for exterior paint, solvent based paint and interior paint. And one very good example of the improvement of glows using hydrous kaolin. So, you can see over here kaolin 1 and kaolin 2, there is uh, two different properties and I have utilized in interior emulsion paint, but you can see over here that kaolin 1 provides 41 gloss and kaolin 2 provides the 49 around 50 gloss. Both have a same particle size, same whiteness, same brightness and same moisture content and same oil absorption. Then why one can provide little bit low gloss and one provides little bit higher. So, this is all about the how you are going to process this type of materials. So, these are the approximate data I have provided that utilization uh, and calcine kaolin. In calcine kaolin, I also you can see over here in calcine kaolin 1 and calcine kaolin 2, these are the uh, properties you can see over here and using both calcine kaolin. Uh, what I have observed wet scrub resistance in one case I have observed 195 and in another case I have observed 345. It is both are the calcine material, but in this it is a flux calcine material and this is the simple calcine material. So, simple calcine material provides low wet ab abrasion and this calcine kaolin 2 provides very good wet scrub resistance and also we have produced new calcine kaolin which provides glows in your paint formulation. So, recently we have developed this uh, calcine kaolin which provides gloss in paint formulations. Uh, and now barium sulphate, so natural baryties, uh, baryties it has a specific gravity higher. So, you can load more amount in your paint formulation and it is inert and also it reflects the UV radiation having particular size. So, these are its uh, lumps and grey barite and white barites. So, due to sort of time, I will just skip these slides and it has a angular crystal structure and blocky crystal structure you can see over here and these are the percentage loading that provided of the barium sulphate. In powder coating, it utilizes maximum amount and also in decorative coating and automotive coating, it will utilize, it provides very good gloss data. And then talc, talc is a platy structure and in this uh, video I have provided that if you add HCl in pure talc compared to impure talc. So, in impure talc, you will get observed heavily bubble of the calcium carbonate while in case of pure talc you will observe, but the concentration is very low. And similarly, if you add this talc in water, it will float, but in case of impure talc and if you just shake it, it will try to settle down and talc is uh, very uh, softy feel. And <coughs> you can see over here, it is uh, platy structure and this platy structure also one can maintain during the dry grinding or during the wet grinding and based on that it provides the data of the weather resistance. And these are the data uh, of uh, talc and uh, prepared a polyester putty in which we have utilized this talc around 37 percent and in this it provides very good leveling properties and improve the adhesion with the coating film. And we have Moscovite mica, uh, it is a flaky structure and it is more hardness around 2 to 2.5. You can see it is uh, transparent also and sometimes it is in colorful and you can see over here it has a very good high aspect ratio. So, plates having a very large size. So, when you utilize this large plate in your paint formulation, it provides very good weather resistance in your paint formulations and these are the data in various exterior paint, solvent based paint 
and prepared one paint using the mica and it provides very good anti wear performance in paint film and very good mechanical strength. Uh, then we have silica. So there are different terms of the silica. One can say ground silica, tripoli, flint, silica sand and precipitated silica, fume silica, they are the synthetic silica, solgel silica, it is also synthetic and amorphous silica. When you utilize silica in your paint, it provides very good matte effect as well as it provides the viscosity control. And also it provides very good scratch resistance. So these are data I have provided over here. And then we have feldspar. Feldspar also it has a very good more hardness scale around 6. So when you utilize in your paint formulation, it provides very good weight scrub data. And you can see over here, it's how its lumps looks like and how its micrograph like little bit angular blocky type and it is a hard material. And then natural oxide we have and natural oxide it has a more hardness 5 to 6 and it is in red color and brown color also depending on the mines available. And when you utilize in paint formulation, it provides very good reinforcement with the film due to finer or due to spherical particle size. And red oxide, it is only utilized in the industrial and automotive primer to reduce the corrosion. And these are some paint, anti-corrosive paint. So this is summary. So industrial minerals, they are provides very good physical and chemical properties for the paints. Also it provides very good gloss and opacity and they are valued for their chemical and physical properties. And we provide cost effective natural solution for decorative and industrial paints. So this is from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, uh, we can take one or two questions if there are any. Uh, the time will permit only the, those many questions. Or maybe you can talk to him over the lunch. Yes. Yes. We strongly believe that uh, 20 micron limited, it is always supportive to surface coating society. And we appreciate and, and acknowledge their contribution to the surface coating society. Actually, I called up on uh, MD of uh, 20 micron, Mr. Latil Bhai, because of his family function, he is unable to join. I'll request Prasant Bhave, sir. Is he there, Prasant Bhave, sir? Please do come to accept the memento on behalf of Please join us for the lunch on the ground floor and we will assemble back by 2.35. Is that okay? Thank you so much.
करके अपना प्रेजेंटेशन इधर लोड करो और मुलाजकर को भी बुलाओ ठीक है गुड आफ्टरनून अगेन मैं कॉल मिस्टर राहुल डॉक्टर राहुल कुलकर्णी एंड मिस्टर अमोल मुलाजकर to please uh, get your presentations over here so that we can get ready वेलकम बैक आई कॉल अपॉन डॉक्टर ए जे सिंह टू इंट्रोड्यूस यस to introduce uh, three of our guests one mr satya prakash then uh, dr rahul kulkarni and mr amol mulajkar kindly come up on the dais tip ठीक है। 
Good afternoon. In this session, we have got three lectures. First is by Tipco Engineering. They are uh, manufacturers of uh, turnkey product projects all over India. They are quite exporting also. And uh, engineering products means for uh, chemical and uh, paints and printing inks. So we have got uh, Mr. Sita Prakash. <coughs> he has got a long experience with the, this company for the almost 20 years and looking after sales. I think he is the right person to give the quite uh, good uh, knowledge about our code information about the company. I think he will uh, self introduce A very good afternoon to you all, sir. I am Satyabrakash from uh, Tipco Engineering India Private Limited. And uh, firstly, thanks for the uh, delegates and giving an opportunity uh, to the especially surface coating society to giving an opportunity to present ourselves here. We, Tipco, sir, uh, basically uh, equipment manufacture and we also give turnkey solutions for the paint, ink, coatings and construction chemicals. So today we also give in other sectors also, but today I limit my topic to these four segments. Uh, I, on the agenda, we have just brief on Tipco and especially I cover on the effective mixing and milling technologies, what we can offer to the paint and coating industries a bit of uh, product range what we have and uh, what we are specially known as in the market as a one stop turnkey solution providers and a bit on water based plant and a solvent based turnkey solutions and a bit of on plant automation. A uh, brief tip sir, we are almost uh, closed, we established ourselves in 1985. Today we are one of the leading manufacturers of paint machines. And we do almost 30% of export to other countries also. We are present in paint, ink, resin, cosmetics, pharma, decorative industrial coatings, specialty chemicals and agrochemicals and personal care. Uh, we have a, basically we provide solutions for mixing, milling, homogenization and also a turnkey plant solutions in India as well as in overseas. We have a wide product range sir. Uh, coming to hydraulic mixers, we give both floor and as well as suspended dissolvers. We have TSDs, we also manufacture bead mills, basket mills, pug mills, sigma mixers, puddy machines, attractors, lab models and homogenizers. Today Tipco has strongly uh, in the industry making high quality machines and providing turnkey solutions as a one stop solution provided. Today our infrastructure has uh, very, uh, uh, we have wonderful infrastructure, we are having a lot of CNC machines, VMC machines, laser cutting, polishing machines to, I mean to make uh, accuracy and as well as faster. A brief of what are the CNC machines we have. Today if you want a quality machines, yes, you need a quality machines also to make it. So today we have a world class CNC machines imported from overseas in Korea from USA. We have polishing machines, we also have 5 axis machine, we have laser cutting machine. So everything is in house. So today we are capable of uh, doing a, a, turn, a turnover of around 200 crores. We also have a laboratory setup. If you want, if you can come us with any uh, uh, lab scale uh, type of trial, we can do in our laboratory facility and give other results. Our area is approximately 50,000 square feet. We have, we maintain all the international quality standards, we have a workforce with our in-house engineering design and we have, we can do, today we can operate turnkey solutions from 50 to 500 ton per day production capacities. We offer new designs, efficient products and process solutions. 
we are also having office in Delhi, Sonipat and Pune. We started almost close to more than one year now. These are one of our major clients uh, across India and globally also we supplied. What are the product range we have? This is the main process when you want to mix any powders or chemicals or solvents, everything. So it starts with first mixing. So in if you are really talking about mixing, we start about where you are basic chemicals or whatever the water or solvent, whatever the premix is very, very important. So coming to that uh, in the premix stage, we have a wetting, we had a dispersion and with stabilization. Premix adds a very important stage before you go, before you get a, your final products. So this process of premix is very important. It prevents variation from batch to batch. It gives a consistent weight, size and texture, consistent dispersing ingredients, producing large quantities of uniform duff. And uh, see before uh, if to make any uh, premix, your SOP is very important. So it plays a lot of key role providing a proper machinery there. So coming to the machinery for your premix, this is a basic machinery which we call as hydraulic dispersion. In this we have depending on the application we have various blades we can offer in this. We have butterfly blades with these standard blades. So selecting a proper disperper blade and angle is very very crucial for premix your quality. Selecting right mixer design like whether you want a single shaft, you want a double shaft like that. In this also we have so many like butterfly shaft, mull shaft, anchor belt, homogenizations. So pro selecting a proper blade is very, very key. So coming to the various versions of um, machines, yes, we can do like two blade with a scrapper. We have a butterfly blade, we have a triple scrapper. So this is a basic arrangement of a basic machine. It goes up and down with a holding a container also. So here we all the range we can take. And the range is from 1 HP to 300 HP in this. This is a one way of mixing your thing. But coming to the, there also, we can also give homogenization. For certain products, homogenization is also plays a key role. It not comes with a cowl blade. It comes with a standard design of rotor starter design. Okay, this is a rotor starter. One is a rotor and one is a starter. So in this, we can give an inline type in tank type as well as the mixing solution. Like you have a tank from the bottom, it will go into your pump and then comes back. It uses an efficient production process. You can cut down your time on the production cycle. And we also have homogenization in this in tank. We can also give for the IBC mixers and your standard design where these are, we have various type of starter designs. Even though it is a rotor is single, but we have various starter designs basing on your product, basing on your process solutions. And today all these machines are made our under CNC machine, so we can give very, very accurate. If you look at this, uh, uh, the, the gap between this rotor and stator will be approximately 1 mm to 2 mm. So today we can make this, ensure that you will get the same quality because of CNC machines. So basically homogenization process in this helps in proper dispersion, deagglomeration, emulsification of powders. So it is still much better than your cowl blade. Then coming to another, another process we, after mixing, we also have, we also make basket mills. This is a process where mixing and milling done in the single system, okay. And we have some customized solution like if you have a multiple purpose and you want to have a one, one single HSD with the three tanks, you can have multiple tanks. You can do this one 30 minutes, this is over, still you can use it again just to turn the machine to another 90 degrees, you can use this machine, again turn 90 degrees, you can so In a single machine, you can make three production facilities. So you can really cut down your production time and increase your. After mixing, the important process is grinding and milling. So this is the second stage. So in grinding and milling, having a right bead mill with the right size of beads is very key. So when you are selecting a bead mill, so these um, uh, parts will play a main role like what is the mechanical seal you are using, what is the material of construction, what is the gap separator, the screen design, pump what you are using, safety interlocks, availability of spare parts after sale. Today you have n number of manufacturers in India and also in China from overseas. But these all plays important role. Even okay, today you are getting from China or elsewhere, but availability of spare parts, 
and after sale service is very key. Again, today I have some many um, MNC manufacturers who can give a better quality, whether you are putting a right amount of money to get the better service from them. So this is a basic uh, uh, mixing and milling grinding process. Once, as I told, this is a premix where you have HSDs. After that, this after premix, this machine the material goes into the bead mill, where you have either uh, you have a grinding it and one pass, second pass, or third pass. Okay. So in selecting a uh, bead mill, uh, beads play a very crucial roles depending upon what type of final product you want to have. Basing on that, you have to select your beads, whether you have a range from today 0.6 mm beads to a range of 2 mm beads. So basing on what final product you want, we can size it accurately and give the according to the solution. Today we make two range of bead mills with a gap separator design and as well as a screen design. So basing on your final product, our engineers are capable in designing and today we have a process engineers where they can come to your site and stabilize your system. So these are various models we have in this. In this we have a range from 5 liters to a range of 100 liters. The flow capacities you get from 0.5 LPM to a range of 30 LPM. And today we make all the material of construction, SS304 we have, SS316 we can do in ceramic, we can do in silicon carbide, we can also give in PU. And we can also today we developed a model with uh, TC pins also. So we, the range what you have in the market, we provide all the range in the in the Indian market. This, are, this is the internal shells, this is of uh, cal uh, silicon carbide or TC. Basically general in the standard market is either SS304 or SS316, but to get a better because today you have uh, lot of R&Ds are going, people are wanting different material, market switches. So these are some materials which can give a better cooling effect or better uh, life compared to your corrosion chemicals. So we have different metallurgies in this also. This uh, basically this we do not manufacture in India, we get it imported from outside. And coming to construction chemicals, it is a huge market which is growing in India. Uh, like in construction, it is a huge industry where you have admixtures, we had putty, concrete curing compounds, waterproofing chemicals. But basically end of the day it, it is a mixing of various products of liquids or powders. Okay. So in this uh, we have a wide range like we have attritors, we have pug mills, pluff shear mixers, ball mills, vertical bead mills, sand mills, ribbon blenders, sigma mixers, powder cans. We can almost offer any solutions in the construction chemical industry. This is, I'm just giving all picks in the same slide, so I don't want to go more. But it's basically it's a mixing of either powders or it's a mixing of either liquids. Basing on your budget, we can give automatic, semi-automatic, or if you want to run on a SCADA, we can give on SCADA also. So we also have lab models. Yeah, before going to any production, yes, you need a lab models. We have lab models if of all the range, whatever we manufacture, we have a lab models where we can have from 1 liter to a range of 10 liters. These all lab models are available in mixers, bead mills, dispersers, attritors, whatever we manufacture. And today we can also give somebody wants, no, no, sir, we want some specially customized solutions. We are open to that. We can give customized solutions also. And I'll just go on to the turnkey solutions. Uh, this is what I planned and this is a total turnkey to have a look. I touch upon basically today market uh, from solvent to basically moving to the water based paints basic, uh, maybe because of pollution effects or the stringent conditions from the government. So I just focus on water based which is a growing industry. There are a few projects we are already done in water based industries. Like today we are done for JK Max, we are also in with Aditya Billa, we are done with Grovel and with a, this is a chromatic which is a Uganda. So we are also doing in overseas also projects. So coming to water based paints, it starts from storage tanks, how you store your raw materials, then after that utility services and how the silos and how the powder conveying is there. Again, a little bit on liquid transferring systems, additives, wash water tanks, again the main process, TSDs and mixers, after that you have pumps, walls, piping design, control and automation, filling and packing, palletizing. This shows starting from your raw material to your final finished product. 
and all this we can offer from TIPCO. This is just layout, we already done some close to 30 projects with uh, this, this is just to show how the plant looks and how it can be. So these are the storage tanks where the how the water can be lifted from storage tanks with a simple P and ID diagram how it will be and this is a totally automated process. So the storage tanks can go from starting from 10 meter cube this is almost close to 60 meter cube of storage tank. Then how about uh, from TSDs to mixers these are TSDs where you manufacture on water based plant in this we can give on fixed basis and load cell basis also. This is our in-house design of TIPCO with a multi shaft like, like in this you have a two shafts like one is a center shaft which is having a coal blade the other one is you are having a scrapper ok and this is a hydraulic system which goes up and down. So you have all the facilities this is one of the latest model and uh, convenient for service and for any maintenance also. And again from TSD basically TSD where you mix a premix type of thing where you make your mill base from TSD it goes to mixers where mixers you can dilute or it is your final product of your paint. So in this also we have various designs with blades with baffle blades with everything we can also have various designs basing upon your own mixers. And coming to TSD how mixers are fixed actually. If you see TSD occupies almost 62 percent of viscosity and majorly 60 to 70 percent are powders. These are TSD levels ok. On this these are the silos where your powders are or liquids are get. From this this is goes into the TSDs from TSD mill base it goes to mixers ok. This is a one of unique design developed by TIPCO to have a space saving. Earlier you have a plants where TSDs mixers are at the same level and silos at the top occupying huge floor space but it is an efficient design we are giving to most with a G plus 3 level like in ground level you have all the mixers and in first level you have TSDs and third level you have all the silos. So it stay it goes in a vertical space saves lot of your ground space. And these are the powder conveying system just to show these are the powders where the powders will get into this from where I have shown in the earlier slide like powders then TSDs ok this is the powders. Today we can use total automation solution for the powder conveying system either if you want a manual you want automation we can do both the. These are the some of the powder conveying system design like you no know, you, you will get it from silos you can get from Jumba bags you have charging hoppers you have bag seating machines you have bin actuators. We can we are well aware of the powders starting from 0.3 density to a bulk density of 2. So, basing on the powder uh, qualities or whatever properties we can offer various solutions of powder conveying system. In your case you can see here it is a single line means it is a single powder no issues at all. But once you have a powder of different ratios and if you have a problem of corrosion then we are suggesting a lines with 7 different powder lines which going to 7 silos. So, we can give both the designs. Okay, then comes to liquid automation other than powders you also have some sort of liquids of 30 percent. So, liquids are basically comes in a barrel from barrel we are stored into storage tanks everything on the load cells from here it will go into your plant basing on your recipe. Suppose one liquid one needs 10 percent liquid to 20 percent liquid 3 to 5 percent. So, it all operates on SCADA it goes automatically basing on your liquids. And we also today uh, this might be some might be a new of the pigging system, but uh, nowadays you no know, basing on the industry or some applications pigging system is also coming. So, basically pigging system is a pipeline uh, way if any material is left in the pipeline. So, it can be solved through pigging system. Suppose you have uh, generally uh, you come with a red color after that green color there is yellow color. If you want to remove the whatever left in the pipeline. So, the pigging system plays a role. This, uh, this system works how like if there is a red color inside the pipeline this pig will move and clear all the liquid inside it. So, that if for the next line it will be totally fresh. So, there is no contamination from recipe 1 to recipe 2 or recipe 3 ok. This is where the pigging system is used. So, we are also well aware of this if somebody requires we can give this pigging system also. 
Then after your raw material is everything is made, made into a paint, then you need a filling systems. In here generally the majorly the market needs two types of systems. One is retail that is 1 liter and 4 liter. The other is the bulk filling which is 10 liters and 20 liter cans. So basing on our experience, it's not a product from Tipco, but we as a turnkey solution, we with the outsource, we can give these solutions basing on your plant capacity, whatever you need. With automation, semi-automatic, even lead, uh, lead token dispensing, whatever the range of markets you have, we can provide all the solutions. And today the buzzword uh, making a material space very important. So you have an automatic racking systems where you have a vertical racking of all your finished product. Today uh, we can uh, totally guided by auto robots. Like today, if you look at uh, like um, Amazon or what, how they are using their material systems totally on the vertical. Here, once the material is done in the buckets, it will be totally automated on the robot. It will pick your uh, bucket and takes stores it. Once you want to deliver it, again the same robot will go and pick up your material and puts into the delivery station. So automatic. If you want this, we can give, the to give a total automatic solution on robot. It is basically for the finished goods. Okay. Then a bit on plant automation, uh, like uh, we have done in coming, this is a solvent base, whereas earlier I covered the water base, coming to solvent is much, we do not have huge plant like what, but in solvent, what is a major factor is solvent, which is a very hazardous material. So you need to have a proper safety protection system for the, to handling the solvent. So, Basing on your design, we can give various like raw material, how inlaid, solvent yard, utility and pumping systems. Basically, it is much easier than water, but only thing handling of solvent is a bit difficult. So you need to have a proper firefighting alarms and firefighting, uh, whatever the equipment you are using, it should be a fire, fire safety. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is a bit on automatic how we give it. It is, again, we give various design of the plants basing on your application. Like we almost prefer to use it less ground place we want to go more of a vertical so that you can you can have a expansion in the future okay these are the, some of the plants we already done like these are the mixers all done by tipco you can see the pipelines with automation control totally these are the few we can if you want this is a scada layout in the scada you can see what recipes are going everything will be so so the plant can be automated with three or four people everything this is a solvent yard, underground is a solvent, these are the pumps with totally automized, okay. This is an again uh, uh, SCADA view, how you are mix, if there is a mixer level, everything will be indicating, you will see the what, the liquid level is here, in here the liquid level is here, if there is an empty, it will have a proper alarming system. Again, you have also coding on your pipes, which color is going, which color is what, everything we can show on your SCADA. This is a just batch automation card. Today you need not to tell your recipe to any of your even doesn't even your production guy need not to what you are making, what is your mixture, what is your formulation. Everything can be done on a automation basis. Whoever the one R and D person can hold off this. Just put the recipe basing on this your solvent whatever one two three four five six whatever everything will be automated going. Nobody knows what's happening in the plant. It is all everything, if you want this system can be visible at production level, can be at the plant room, can be at your CD, CEO level also, okay. Just to show other various designs how we operate and whatever this piping design is done by internally with our own engineering team, these are some of other views you are already done, these are also some of the plans we have executed. The basically before going we check everything on the P and AD diagrams, everything O say, we get to the approval, then we go for a automation. So last slide of the, what is the benefit of automation? Today the benefit is reduction in manpower, with the same manpower you can have more production capacities and again the major thing is consistency of your product. Today whatever the batches you are making, batches 1, 200, the consistency is maintained, higher production low wastage, today we can have a such a system that if you do not want to waste, it can be recycled, can we go to the ETP plant and get it done. Saving energy, you can save tremendous amount of energy on by going an automation cycle. 
again complete traceability if you have done something wrong in the past you can have a traceability where you went wrong and again the stock management basing on you need not to store extra stock because all the stock level management can be seen in your automation table how much raw material you can keep how much finished product is going everything can available again the best, biggest thing is safety whatever happens you can just get a safety or alarm at your plant so just thank you thank you for your time Yes, sir. We I have not explained much. Yes, we have a jet cleaning system. For basically, sir, when you are going to water-based uh, plant, no, there is a lot of material get stuck into the TSDs. We are giving a jet system which is almost operates at 25 to 50 bar pressure. So we are also giving yes, jet cleaning system is a mandatory, and we are giving that, sir. What about the solvent-based? Uh, so solvent-based uh, lit we wanted nowadays. No, solvent is a bit hazardous. So, we are not giving any automation system there. So, it is basing on the manual system with minimum pressure of 8 to 10 bar because solvent is a bit hazardous. Yes. yes, sir. Uh, we can give both the ways, sir. Basically, we do not automize too much. We only automize the water line which will be at 20 kg pressure. From there, we give a jet pressure. Uh, pipeline to manually handle it. We are tried automation system also giving some uh, mixer type of thing in the TSDs, but sometimes it gets clogged, sometimes it works does not properly. So we give a jet handle so that the manually some person can go and remove the TSDs. Okay sir, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Rahul Kulkarni, please. In the morning session, you have uh, heard Dr. Ravi Kulkarni. From LK Chemical, they are experts, or they are the leading company in the country for silicon chemicals. Most of the thing, new things are coming in the market. And now Dr. Rahul, he will be talking technically on some of the products or the processes. Right, sir? Yes. I think he will introduce within two, three lines. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. No? So close, huh? Is this better? Hello? 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 Okay, wow. <laughs> Great. I. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Rahul Kulkarni. I'm uh, uh, the head of technology and marketing for uh, LK Chemicals. Uh, I think you had um, uh, one of the awardees today in the morning was uh, Dr. Kulkarni, who is one of our, who is our MD and founder of the company. I've been working with LK for ten years now, um, and I am uh, technically a scientist, but I have lost the science side a little bit over the years. So uh, I'll do my best uh, to um, uh, to keep it up. It's it's a little bit more of an application presentation on some of the newer things that take place in silicons. So. In general, silicons are something which is not that commonly used in the past in uh, coatings commercially, uh, but have gained a lot of momentum in the last 10-15 years, primarily because they have become much more accessible financially, economically. Uh, the technology has become a bit more widespread and people are figuring out how to combine silicons with other materials because silicons are the non-carbon polymers. Everybody here is used to carbon polymers, your acrylates, epoxies, urethanes, and this is something which is very different. So I just have a few quick slides um, on the background of the company overall. We are a 33-year-old company based out of Pune. Our office, ironically, is exactly 200 meters from this location, this hall, on the other side of uh, Barney Road, 
uh, we have um, uh, we've primarily innovation driven uh, cost effective and sustainability driven because a lot of the items related to recyclability of silicons also come under um, some of our um, subsidiaries not the main LK chemicals itself uh, we're ISO reach um, and we export a lot of our product more than 50% of our product is exported and we do that to about 35 different countries uh, you can see below uh, some of the other things we do uh, but uh, primarily what I'd like to highlight is that we have a DST approved lab and the lab is the heart of everything that we do because we are one of the, um, if you look at silicon synthesis in India, we are pretty much one of the only homegrown Indian companies that does, does, that does this now. Um, there are the multinationals, but uh, we will do this in-house. That also means that we are very fast. We're fast, we're small, and we can get solutions to people relatively quickly. Uh, just a quick idea about our global presence, and these are our milestones. So from 1990, uh, we started exporting in 1999. Uh, we have a second plant came up in 2003, third in 18, and we will do our fourth plant in the US now in 2025. Uh, Technology-wise, uh, we started with silicons in 1994. Our name is LK Chemicals, brand name LK Silicons. We were actually meant to make many other chemicals, but somehow or the other, we started with silicons, we love silicons, and now we only do silicons. Um, we started doing functionalization in 96. 2007, we started doing hydrosylation, which is a very important chemistry for silicons because you can combine silicons with any, almost any other organic moiety available. You name epoxy, acrylic, whatever you want. Um, in 2008, we finished commercializing our sustainable monomer uh, processes for uh, recycling, which is, again, subsidiary part of the business. And in 2018, which is most relevant to today's conversation, we started with silicon resins, which are um, used in coatings. Our locations, uh, we have our head office in Pune, uh, R&D center in Bosri, which is being expanded uh, in January this year. We'll finish that. Uh, Kopoli facility is our uh, second plant, and third is the uh, biggest facility in Lote, in, which is down at the very bottom. I will use this. Yeah, over there. That's an 11-acre site, about 20,000 metric ton capacity, but uh, primarily polymers. We don't make too many emulsions. Uh, these are our industry segments. Uh, from process, uh, chemical process, textiles, uh, but the main ones, of course, personal care and petrochemicals <laughs> and construction. So I'll just spend two minutes on talking to you. For though, uh, there are a lot of experts over here who know silicons, but for those who don't um, know what silicons do and why they're used, I'll just quickly talk about that. Silicons, in general, organic silicons have very low surface tension. So you're going down to 20 dynes per centimeter. The only thing that can beat silicons is fluoro. But fluoro has a lot of toxicity issues, and therefore they're very sparingly used now. Uh, most of our organics are sitting at 30, so we're sitting at 20. Fluoro at 16, we're not too far off. Um, so that low surface tension gives a lot of interesting surface properties for the silicons. Because of the chemistries we can use, we can make super hydrophobic, all those nice lotus effect pictures which you may see in the market, that's using silicons. We can also do super hydrophilic surfaces surprisingly also. The most hydrophilic surfactants actually are made out of silicons. Uh, they're very stable, bio-compatible, people drink silicons, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. Um, it goes in some of our food applications. Uh, stable at very uh, wide range, especially temperature. pH, okay, you know, there's some maybe better materials, but temperature, you can go down to the negative 50s plan, you can also go above 300. And certain systems nowadays which are being used with organic silicons are going past even 600 degrees centigrade. Um, and very good lubricating properties. Overall, what ends up happening is that this SIO bond, you can see carbon is there, but carbon is not in the main chain. SIO bond is very, very flexible, which gives it that a very high temperature property range over there. You can build a lot of different molecules on top of this, and um, you can create various shapes based upon what I will show you on the next slide. So where do silicons come from? The main silicon starting point is this, silica. Silica is sand. It is, uh, I don't know, some you know, uh, massive proportion of the Earth's crust over here. It's the same thing as beach sand. You take beach sand, you melt it, you make glass. You ground that back up, you get silica again. If you take ultra-pure silica and you reduce it, you get silicon metal. Silicon metal goes into three applications. One is, of course, photovoltaic cells, solar cells. Second one is your semiconductor industry. And the third one is organopolymeric silicons. From there, you can convert these into silanes. Silanes are the small little monomeric silicon moieties. And then you can polymerize them into silicon molecules. Now here I show you one very nice straight chain. Straight chain silicon is exciting, good, good commercially, but very, very boring. 
So with these straight chain polymers, we can also do other things. We can start adding branches. We can make blocks, um, A, B, A, A, B, N, different types of polymers with the, because you can use the entire chemistry set of condensation polymers with these silicons. But again, using hydrosylation, we can also put in your addition type polymers also. And then of course, silicon resins. Now silicon resins are a little bit different. Every silicon you see which is linear, pretty much each and every one of them is going to be liquid. They're very nice, low viscosity to very high viscosity liquids. If you want to make a silicon rubber, you want to make a silicon hard, you have to start cross-linking it like many of the other chemistries you're aware of. Silicon resins though are almost exclusively cross-linked. It is, if you look at it, almost like silica glass. This structure here, if I take every one of these R's and replace it on this, I think it's very small over here. If you replace every R with an OSI and just keep going on building it up, you get silica glass again. So silicon resin is sort of a halfway between a silicon liquid polymer and a silica glass. And you end up with properties like that. Except the exciting thing is that all these R's can be anything. Methyl, phenyl, acrylic, amino, whatever you want. And that again means that you can do pretty much anything under the sun, which means that I will be occupied for the rest of my career with silicons if I choose to. So in our construction silicons, um, I'll just quickly go into this uh, for two minutes. Um, you know, you may have seen these pictures before. You can get this on cement. You can get these on textiles now also. You can get these on a lot of, pro on a lot of products. Of course, it's very pretty for me to show it to you. Reality of coatings is this much. It's a great marketing thing. Silicons do attract dust. Dust will tend to kill this thing. Does it mean the coating has lost its efficiency? The answer is no. The product is absolutely perfect. You will get your five, 10 year, 20 year lifetime, except you just may not see these effects. But you know, some people love to show this. I also love to show this, especially when you take those plates, you tilt it one degree, the water droplet will slide off. Um, so silicon's role in paints and coatings now, I'll uh, touch upon that quickly goes across from silane, siloxanes, silicon resin, and silicon polyether I specified because this is silicon surfactants. So we have adhesion promoters, um, you know, siloxanes going to overcoat anti-stains. This is something we've done historically for the last 15 odd years, but I won't talk about it today. Silicon polyethers. Silicon polyethers are very interesting because for those people who work with surfactants, organic surfactants mixed with silicon surfactants, one plus one sometimes will give you three, sometimes will give you zero. You never know what you're going to get. Surprisingly, as a scientist, I hate saying that, but that is actually what ends up happening. So it's again a very unexplored field because um, you can get very, very exciting properties if you mix sil uh, organic surfactants with silicon surfactants. And people are already doing it uh, today because you can make a very good emulsifying surfactant which has got very low foaming by adding a very small amount of silicon, for instance. Um, Dispersants, emulsifiers, and of course, the silicon resins. Silicon resins now come in where protective heat, corrosion, water, weather, organic modifications. Now, when I just take the top five, I'm talking about pretty much anything a coating is supposed to be doing. And um, I'll elaborate a little bit on that further. Now, um, in construction overall, we've got you know, things like sealants, water repellents, deformers, release, uh, silanes, the small molecules are still there, adhesives, protective coatings, and waterproofing admixtures. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about all of these. Um, I'll just quickly spend two minutes on what we do in some other product lines before I get to the actual main part of the discussion which I was looking to show you today. For um, We make silane, siloxane blends. These are what are popularly giving that particular hydrophobic effect. So these are generally used as overcoats on top of your current exterior paints. You can use it interior also. You can put it on any type of surface. If you wish to put it on textiles, you have to use a slightly different version of this type of product. But essentially, this is what gives you your super hydrophobic uh, behavior. Um, these are very often now used in restoration of temples, stonework, um, exteriors of uh, buildings, and some people will add these into paints also. Uh, there, the paint stability is of, always of concern. And since the paint community is, does not have a single binder system, it's always a bit of a um, adjustment to figure out which product is going to work in which paint. We have some other water-based additives. Um, you know, some of them are primers, paint additives. Most of these silicon products are looking to give you hydrophobicity or stain repellency in the paints. These are the two main things because these are all the siloxane-based type of things. These are not the main binder systems. They're sort of co-binders or just simply additives to give you 
um, uh, this type of behavior at relatively low dosages, two, three, four, five, six percent. You got reactive silicon additives. Um, some of the um, exterior systems today use um, hydroxy terminated fluids. They co-react with the rest of the products in the emulsions. You got other reactive fluids. Um, this S104 is the textile coating products. Um, Sarah Garby use it often in uh, anti-stain properties, like all your anti-stain floor coats are silicon based today. And uh, then you got silanes. So we provide silanes also. Um, there's a whole list of them. Again, I won't talk about the whole list, but just letting you know these are available. And then finally, I get to silicon resins. So silicon resins are, again, not the primary uh, material of use in coatings today. One challenge which will come about them is it is still a challenge to get these into water-based systems today. But hopefully in the next couple of years, everybody sitting here along will collaborate together and figuring out how to get that done in a better way. The challenge with silicon systems are, as we go in front, realize that silicon systems tend to be moisture curing systems primarily. And moisture curing, putting that into an acrylic emulsion, uh, sorry, a water emulsion is always a, a challenging task. But you've got heat paint, uh, heat resistant paint, marine coating paint, additives, hybrid systems, top coats, which I'll talk about a lot today, and some other additives for powder coating systems along with your epoxies. So I'll give you a, a rough idea first of some of the product lines we have so you understand uh, uh, them as we go into the next part of the discussion. So in silicon, um, again, I'm so sorry, this is a very tiny looking thing, but trust me, you have silicon SI on it, you have one open bond, do I put a methyl, do I put a phenyl on it? These are the two primary groups I can put onto it. And um, I can talk a little bit on why we do that. So if I put only methyl, what will happen? Silicon methyl, oxygen, that's what I have in this thing. The SiO is hidden. So for those who like structure property, silicon with methyl has almost zero polarity, almost no bondability with anything. So these coatings are good moisture self-cure coatings. They form very hard, coat hard coatings, very quick, very brittle, unfortunately. There are ways to make them slightly softer. Um, they give you complete UV resistance. There's nothing in this which will touch... I mean, this, I can put this in the sun for 100 years, nothing's going to happen to it. Um, it gives you a reasonable amount of heat resistance. The biggest problem with this methyl curing material is it, ha it sticks to nothing. Okay, I can, I can put a drop of methyl resin on this table right now here. I can figure out a system to cure it in exactly 20 seconds if I put a lot of catalyst in there. Moisture cure system, UV cure system. But I can flick it with my finger, it'll come off. It has got almost no bondability. Which means, although, that it is a very good masking agent and is now uh, one of the primary places where it's being used as a masking agent because you can mask and then take the film off relatively easily. Um, MNC this is the curing self-cure version, a non-curable version means you have to put a curing agent into it and then there's a solid version of it. Um, I'll pr talk a little bit about just one of these. The second one is where we start adding phenyl. So in that extra bond I have, if I take a few of the methyl out and I start putting a phenyl there, what happens? Phenyl gives me more toughness, it gives me more adhesion, it gives me more heat resistance. And these properties are very useful while, unlike all the phenylated systems which you are maybe very aware of in the rest of the coatings industry, which tend to turn yellow, this phenyl group somehow, because it's bound to silicon, is more oxidation resistant, does not turn yellow, and it's not in the main chain. So it does not compromise the polymer integrity at all. So even though you got phenyl in there, the UV resistance is still insanely good. So you can form tough hard coatings, high gloss, very good heat resistance. These are the type of coatings now where um, they start adhering to substrates, which is useful. They also become of a, sol of a um, um, solvent, uh, sorry, they become more compatible with other resins also. So if you want to start mixing them into other resins, the methyl mixes with almost nothing. It's a big challenge for us. You start adding phenyl, you can start putting these into polyesters, alkyds, epoxies, for instance. You can also um, start getting them to some extent into acrylics, although it's a little bit difficult. We can go low phenyl, liquid, liquid, liquid. Um, you can put this into xylene. Um, this is for um, industrial high temperature coatings. I'll talk about that for one minute uh, later on. You can make this into flakes and you can also go high phenyl. High phenyl means you're just adding more phenyl, removing more methyl out of it. So these higher flannel ones, uh, they become more solid-like solid naturally, become even more temperature resistant, 
and um, they again have more compatibility with other resins. They also are more expensive. So uh, people always try to say, let's use as much fennel as we need. Let's not go overboard because of the cost perspective. Um, we now talk about a few products which contain, uh, which are, uh, uh, which have epoxy on them. We also have some systems with amino alkyls on them. And uh, we also have a general silicon resin system with just uh, methyl. These are hydro super hydrophobic. You want an additive that will give you water resistance. This is a product. It's used very often. I'll give you examples where you already see this product being used in your daily lives. Um, for uh, women uh, who use makeup, all your liquid lipsticks, your foundations, when you cry, when you do this, you don't want it to come off on your tongue. That's all silicon, which is preventing it from coming off in your mouth. So um, very, very water resistant. But if you want to still pull it off, you can. You know, you use the wipe, uh, makeup will come off. So now I talk about just some results of uh, certain things. Heat resistant paints, for those people may be aware of it, but uh, just a general idea. Um, if you use methyl resin, you can get heat resistance up to 500 degrees. Uh, we do a adhesion test after quenching. So in, in this particular test, we take it up to temperature, leave it there for, I think, an hour. Then we bring it back down, quench it in water at room temperature, do this cycle four times, and uh, see if the coating is still integrally stuck to the metal panel. You can see here 500 degrees for methyl resin possible, but at 600, we start failing. Um, we also pass every UV test for every product. You add uh, phenyl into it, we pass it up even up to 600 degrees. Um, except for one particular uh, resin over here, you go to um, high phenyl also, this lower one, you pass everything. If we use pure phenyl, we actually have even hit 700 degrees centigrade um, survival, which is the highest currently there for any standard um, organic um, like polymeric coating. Um, if you use hybrids, hybrids means you put the silicon with you know, amino, epoxy or some other group, we've been able to touch even 500 degrees now. Uh, one of them we've recently come up with 600 degrees. So just an idea in the picture of the adhesion tests um, of all these different systems. We're using here aluminum uh, flake pigment. Uh, so these are standard usage for any type of coating you want on say uh, process equipment, chimneys, uh, bakeware also coming up right now, uh, very actively used over there. This is one more example with black oxide. So black oxide pigment again over here, we're passing adhesion tests. Uh, this is, happens to be a matte finish. This one, black oxide passed 650 centigrade with four quenches. Uh, 500 hour UV chamber, I mean this we can keep going on and on and on. We cross a thousand very often. Uh, SST salt spray test. Solvent resistance also for silicones is very, very good. Much better than what you'll get with epoxy. Also, so this is 50 wipes with acetone IPA. Chemical resistance with acid hydrocarbon we've done. Um, we just have not done base, but uh, this is chemical resistance with sulfuric acid. Uh, so we pass that also, and you have a relatively not so hard film, but uh, we can even get up to 6H on certain other films. So what is the now coming next? This is more old. What are the newer things taking place now in these resins? So one is the hybrids with epoxies, uh, becoming more and more popular over the years. Uh, here we are putting epoxy groups under the silicon resin. And what does that do? You bring the joy of epoxy, which sticks to everything, with the joy of silicon, which is UV resistant. If you go for the UV resistant epoxies, which are the aliphatic type ones, they are very, very expensive. They are actually more expensive than the silicon systems. So once you combine these two, you can start getting into coatings where you can remove the primers also. So nowadays we find customers who will do clear coats without a primer on them. Um, so you go into single coating type systems. Um, just ease of use, less thickness, less polymer. So while silicones may sometimes be more expensive, when you take into the fact that you're using a thinner coat and less application, you often come out cost beneficial. When you add in the durability, you go very, very cost beneficial. Um, so these are some of the properties. Um, I'll again highlight UV, adhesion now in this case here, corrosion resistance, this has been used in anti-corrosion coatings for quite some time now. Heat resistance, no yellowing, reasonably good flexibility, this really depends on your curing system, whichever one you use. Um, good abrasion, scratch, uh, no isocyanate, anti-graffiti also in some cases, single coat application. And one thing I've not mentioned here is that in one or two cases we've even been able to impregnate anti viral antimicrobial like additives into it to give that as part of the coating. 
So an example here, it's a standard looking clear coat. Um, we pass all the adhesion tests and everything just to give you an idea. Unlike most other coatings, you'll get a contact angle here naturally of 105. Most of the other clear coats like epoxy standard is around 50 or 45. Uh, PU's acrylics are also in the same region, maybe a little bit higher. So your natural content angle and water resistance is shown right over here and you pass pretty much everything else. A lot of these tests are still ongoing, but um, I'll update this maybe by next year. So where would this coating be of supreme benefit and importance? This is one of the problems we're facing right now in the world is this whole thing, urban heat effect, global warming, smart buildings, reduce AC load. Um, if you stay on the top floor of a building, you will notice that the temperature is four degrees to five degrees higher than that of the second last floor. That is because you are conducting heat from the, seal, from the terrace into your house. Uh, this is a known problem. If for those who have industrial sheds, the temperature inside can be as much as five degrees, eight degrees hotter than the outside. People now provide solutions like you can put in insulation, sandwich, PU insulation, epoxy polystyrene insulation on the top over there. It makes the systems much more complicated. We can go relatively easier with heat reflective coatings based upon silicon. Silicon is already used commercially in heat reflective coatings, but it's the soft silicons which are used in, uh, abroad in US, Europe as a DIY solution as do it yourself. You go upstairs on your roof, you paint your roof, it lasts three to five years, you go and do it again three to five years later. These coatings though, we are now looking at on other things like say metal for instance. And we can see here, we can go get a 12 degree temperature difference um, in idealized test conditions. Here we're using epoxy silicon with two fillers uh, butyl acetate as just a viscosity thinner and we're using a hardener which is a silicon based hardener also over here. Um, so one step application, self, self cleaning and highly durable. So where does it compare with epoxy? Epoxy is also sometimes used on metals directly. Um, gloss a little bit lower, contact angle much higher. Um, SRI value for this is still under testing but we are at 12 degrees so you're getting your reflectance with TiO2 in it. Uh, heat resistance may or may not be critical, but the main item here is that you can see the yellowing that takes place in epoxy afterwards. And this drops the SRI value, the ref heat reflectance value very, very rapidly. So after one year, you're almost as if you just have painted your roof yellow, which is not so great. Um, we'll pass salt spray, spray and critically we'll pass abrasion resistance. So you can make metal panels coated for your um, uh, aluminum steel roofing sheets with silicone on it, which will last very long and stay white and stay heat reflective for a very, very long time. Just some idea about um, salt spray here. I mean, this, this, both the products actually pass salt spray, but solvent resistance for the silicon epoxy is actually better than that of just plain epoxy. Uh, that's more critical for industrial uh, applications. The second one, I think, and this will be the, I think, last one which I'll talk about today, is on the roof waterproofing coatings. Today, roof waterproofing um, is done in a multi-step application. Uh, some people may have had it done to their houses or their terraces recently. Um, it's a four system application. You do a base coat, uh, a fabric sheet of uh, non-woven, then you do a second coat and then you do top coat. It's good, it gives you the heat reflectance, but it does not last. And the fabric comes off, uh, it, and the biggest problem with those coatings is, is they mar or they get dirty very quickly. If you walk on your terrace, which is on, have this, has this coating on it, your footprints will be seen. You wash them, your footprints will still be seen. So wherever you go, you know, if you have a terrace, you put it, the path to your sink, the path to the door, you'll see a whole bunch of footprints everywhere. It looks terrible and it also starts damaging the coating in that area and that slowly spreads across. So if you're using silicon right now, this is under development, we go again back to one step application, self-cleaning, you wash with water, everything comes off. Highly durable, heat reflectivity, water resistance, and critically non-staining. So an idea here, market sample, you take your bottom coat, coat the fabric, do the final coat. It's a four coat application. Material cost here is about 10 to 14 rupees. Labor cost, roughly similar. Durability, one to three years. You go with silicon, I stop right here. Two coat application on the same one. Um, we're gonna keep testing this one here. Uh, material cost 16 to 20 uh, uh, rupees, but labor cost is much lower. So the overall added cost is almost the same. Durability you'll get here can be as high as, at least in testing, will cross 15 years. If we use specialized silicones, we can even go past 30 years. Just an idea here, the market samples fail a lot of items. You'll pass solvent, chemical. These become more critical on an actually actively used terrace because solvent resistance relates to food oils, Chemical resistance also relates to food. People drop food on a terrace. 
Um, abrasion resistance also very important because you will walk on your terrace. And stain repellency also very, very critical. One of the biggest problems is, again, you drop something on it, it stays there forever. So um, durability shown here, again, dust resistance you can see here, maybe not so clear here, but the dust remains on this thing. On this, it goes away. Solvent resistance and stain. This is ink, purple ink. It stays on. You cannot get this off afterwards. On the silicon epoxy, it washes off. This is a simple water spray. It's gone. So I think I'll come to the end of discussion. I've taken 26 minutes. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to just talk about the fact that silicon resins much more accessible right now, um, and its hybrids bring tremendous value uh, coming up over here. It's still a very new field. There's a lot of things to be done in it. Um, if you want to talk anything further, please come. Um, I'll be around. Otherwise, I, uh, there's a uh, Vinayak Dalin, um, Rupesh are sitting in the front over there. You can always talk with them. Our otherwise office is here in Pune. And um, while we bring all of these different properties here, um, I think we all feel that in the future, it's going to become the more, most ideal material of choice for highly durable heat control coatings for smart buildings and the urban heat effect. In today's paper, they said Koregao Park is now hitting 46 degrees centigrade. For those who live in Pune, who remember that Pune never crossed 38 degrees, it's all because of all the construction and concrete that we have, and we need to do something about it. So with that, I'd like to stop, and um, I would be very happy to answer any questions. Yes. Slides, I have seen that key. you are using it as a, you know, some primer application. So you can, you are using as a primer, then how you are going to apply a subsequent coat and how it is going to adhere on that? So if we are doing a primer, a uh, general plain silicon methyl will never work. We'll either have to put a, polaric, a polarity a group on it. So people will sometimes use a silane blend where you have an alcohol group on it which will give polarity or we will use uh, amino functionalized silicons in it. So the amine group will give you both the water repellency but also allow the next surface to uh, item to adhere to it. So amino silicons are used as primers for this reason. It goes up then. And for those primers, it goes up uh, to around 27, 28. But the amine group, if you can, as long as the next coat has something which will uh, interact with the amine group, you will get that bonding then. Yeah. And uh, you are showing ki, you are telling that the heat reflective application, you, you can use this for heat application. Yeah. And what, what is the mechanism? Actually? So the How mechanism is that uh, the silicon being heat transparent, it will remain heat transparent. We are using the titania and the filler systems to do the actual reflection. And the silicon being heat transparent will not degrade. So the main item otherwise in other coatings is that the a uh, polymeric binder degrades and that gives it heat absorption, IR absorption properties. Sorry? Ah, okay. That heat reflectivity is because of the filler, main yes. it is because of filler. Yes. Yeah. And another thing is that when you are adding that uh, phenyl in the silicone moiety, yeah. Its uh, adhesion is increasing. Yes. And so, what is the mechanism? How it, how it is going the to increase? Polarity on the on the phenyl. So, phenyl group has that pi bond, pi cloud above and below it. Okay. So, the phenyl groups tend to have much higher adhesion. It still does not compare to epoxy. Okay. Uh, epoxy still like having an oxygen group is a little bit high, better than that, but phenyl starts giving you that bondability. Okay. Thank you. The siloxin based emulsions, when they are applied on an exterior coating, since the lot of emulsifiers are used, after over a period of time, it is observed that it leaches out and there are some spots. Can you comment on it? Spots? Yeah. On the coating? Coating. Um, in personal experience, I have. Uh, for the sol we've seen more amount of spotting on occasion where with solvent based systems 
ironically base. on water base yeah, water i know base. so uh, i don't know vinay can you comment have we seen spotting we just seen this base the okay 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 so there's one so there's two systems on water based one is the emulsion where we don't tend to get spotting because i'm not i've never had that uh, as a problem to date there's one more which is called potassium methyl siliconate that is a water dilutable silicon which you apply to the surface and does the same uh, super hydrophobic behavior but that actually has a very high tendency to leach inside the substrate and pull out anything that may be willing to be pulled out such as fillers or your um, um, you know concrete uh, additives or whatever which is, will come through so that uh, that effect is happening mainly through potassium methyl siliconate we actually used to make it we stopped making it because there were too many issues with things like this um, but we've started making that again as a product because it has some other applications but we i i ourselves don't always recommend it for exterior high, super hydrophobic behaviors because the uh, milky white emulsions based on saline siloxane don't have this spotting issue thank you thank you doctor it was really interesting i think uh, something is missing in the meetings with the silicon is lot of things to learn and he has got explained in details i think something will be added more and more like this thank you mr doctor now may i call upon mr amol mulaskar is from uh, sojanya leading colorant manufacturers in india so he has lot of things to say let us see you can introduce yourself of course yes i can the best introduction is he is my student <laughs> <laughs> i am going to start with that only so before i put any mask on me let me introduce uh, myself uh, as a student of uh, singh sir and also deshmukh sir is here so i am a proud product of uh, technical institute pune and they taught us uh, the pen technology in fact the, they strongly laid the foundation so if anything goes very well it's their credit if something goes wrong it's my mistake so take it that way and uh, then i'm ready to put mask on me now <laughs> that's my real uh, avatar uh, but well my name is amol mulaskar uh, i head the technology and marketing uh, activities of saujanya color so after polymer is now time to discuss about the color and uh, uh, i by education after my graduation in chemistry i joined uh, this diploma course in surface coating technology pune and then i did my masters uh, in marketing management from manipal university then also i did uh, further study in i am kolkata and then i am i am kolkata alumna and currently also holding and responsibility as a chairman of indian paint association ipa western region for next 2 years uh, well so let's uh, talk my today's i am talking about bringing sustainability in uh, colorants for paint and coatings i am assuming here that colorant and pigment dispersion we all are aware of it but still we can uh, discuss on the basics uh, over the period what i did that whatever i was presenting then i further advancement has happened and then four slides i clubbed them together because i want to present the content is going uh, i mean uh, more and more uh, with the different weightage so saujanya is a global leader uh, in innovative sustainable color solutions that we provide not only to paint industry we also i will show you what all other industries that we cater to last 40 years not 35 40 years now we have completed this year uh, since 1983 the uh, company is incepted uh, 100% indian multinational company total 6 million of liters of colorant that we produce annually the volume is a limitation for us it, the color goes hardly uh, average 2 to 3% in any application we have a full automated world class facility this is asia asia's largest colorant manufacturing facility located in navi mumbai 
Pawnee industrial area. This is fully automatic SCADA system and there is no intervention, human intervention in between the color production. We operate in 50 different countries across the globe uh, through our channel partners, our own offices, our own service personnel. Our flagship product is in Navi Mumbai that is Asia's largest manufacturing facility. Also we have a satellite unit in the same vicinity. We have in Americas, we have uh, setting up a plant in Coretaro in Mexico. Uh, we have our own subsidiary in Mexico, our branch office in Brazil, uh, Southeast Asia. We have our branch office in Singapore. We have our own color matching laboratory uh, recently opened up in Vietnam, uh, color matching lab in Vietnam. And also now we have our own office and sales personnel working in the African region. So what expertise do we have that for any shade, any customer, they come to us, the swift response is very required and we deliver that product in 48 hours. We are everywhere available local, we call that as a global, we are a global company. Global yet we are available locally for all our customers. Infinite shade, shade matching is not a constraint for us. Cost effective very much that we deliver 99% that is the accuracy that we have achieved. And then also operational excellence that we have been now driving throughout our operational plants. We are very biased, unbiased, sorry we are very unbiased to look at the color. The only color we don't like is the skin color. We don't pay attention to it. I mean the skin is dark or skin is white or skin is whatever, we don't pay attention. It's the similarity. We love all colors but green is one of our favorites because it's the color of the nature. Now let's discuss about bringing, what are the initiatives that we are taking up in bringing sustainability into our color solutions. Even today, if you see that the paint market, the paint is getting sold in the market through point of sale tinting system. That point of sale tinting system has been evolved uh, into the western uh, countries during 1970s, late 70s and it came to India during mid 90s or early 200, uh, 2000 years. So still the equation is the same that paint bases, companies, paint companies are making paint bases, pastel base, mid base, clear base and there are 12 to 16 different colors, combination of organic and inorganic pigments, that's what we do. And then it's like a marriage between the paint bases and then colorants and then effectively the thousands of shades, limitless possibilities to offer the color. This whole thing used to be happen into the manufacturing premises of paint companies but because shades gone drastically high in number. Earlier used to be only 50-20 shades but now that number has gone to 5000 shades, 10,000 shades. How is it possible for paint companies to make 10,000 shades into the same premises? Secondly, at different SKUs, different product qualities and how the paint shop is going to sell that. They can't keep the inventory. So what has happened that the, the tinting of the paint, it's called as a postponement of the tinting. So whatever the activity used to happen in the factory, now that is happening into the paint shop. And whenever as a client, if I go in the paint shop and I ask, I want this shade, he instantly mixes that color into the base paint, white paint and he offers to you. This is what is nothing less than the color, evo color evaluation, evolution. Now, this is the important part is that since I said that industrial revolution has happened during 1960s and 70s into the western world and what the focus has given only on the performance. Whatever we were doing that the products they coming out of the western world, they were only focusing on the performance, less attention paid on to the its sustainability. Now natural resource depletion, nobody has cared during 70s and 80s and 90s. Environmental hazard, nobody has paid attention to it. Human health hazard, nobody because we wanted a performance through the product. It is the time now we realize whatever we have done in last 50 years, we are paying a cost of that. Global warming is one of that. So every agenda, I mean the global agenda is to reduce the global warming, reduce the carbon footprint and that is what the traditional chem chemistry that paid attention to performance and now we have to relook whatever we have done. The concept of sustainability in paint and coatings has evolved since last 10 years only. It wasn't there before. We have been talking since last 10 years about the sustainability. 
what has changed because of this? And because of the colorant, we are the follower of the paint industry. Whatever the paint formulation, the composition is changing, we have to make our colorants compatible and in a align with those changes. So, today's raw material profile, though although uh, uh, in principle they are resin and fillers and uh, pigments and additives, but still on a minute level many changes are happening on those fronts. Environmental profile of the paints has been changed. Today low VOC paints has come up, all functional uh, properties on the paint have been embedded, certain pigments, uh, certain paints are compl regulatory compliant. The performance properties have changed. Now the paint even 15 years of guarantee that has come in the market. So also the colorant need to go and play a crucial role uh, with that paint system. Cost economics has changed also. So lot of these things, these are the drivers of the change and because of these change happened in the paint formulations, the colorant, uh, as a colorant formulator also we need to change our approach. Now, last 10 years, we, folk, we worked on the reducing the VOCs, process efficiencies, waste minimization, that all industry, that was the buzzword across the industry that we did. Next year, 10 years, what is going to happen is that more or the increasing use of bio-based renewable feedstock and lesser use of the fossil fuel or non-renewable resources, petroleum products, the use will go down. We don't have any choice. We have to do it. It's a must. <coughs> And then, when we say sustainability, we do not even only talk about the technology. It is a holistic approach what we have taken. It is the technology, also it is a manufacturing, because manufacturing efficient processes, better uh, usage of the utilities, waste minimization, even the packaging, sustainable packaging. Today, if you see the plastic, single-use uh, plastic is banned in India. And then also regulations have come from the government on the paint industry or the packaging industry to recycle the plastic. It is a very big challenge in front of the industry. And then supply chain also that very well planned shipments can even drive the fuel efficiencies and can help reducing the carbon footprints. <coughs> now when I s mentioned about this fossil fuel or renewable feedstock, only 5 percent, whatever the paint is being manufactured in the world, only 5 percent of the paint is using the fossil feedstock. Rest everything 95 percent is still based on the bio-based feedstock that we need to flip the ratio. We, have, we don't have any option of that. Now just imagine the world without oil. I would like to cite an example of automotive industry. EV started running on the roads, right? It's the right step they have taken because they, do, they know that the petrol and diesel is not going to available or it's going to available only next 50 years. After that, what is the survival of that industry? So at the right time, EV started running on the road, paint industry, chemical industry has to wake up today because all the solvents we are not going to get after 20, 30 years. We will be solvent free, we will be oil free, even if I, I mean it is a question, if I ask you uh, water based latex emulsion versus synthetic enamel paint, which is more sustainable? And so you will be surprised to me. VOCs and sustainability are two different things. I would say the, so, uh, the long oil alkyd based product is more sustainable. Water based synthetic, enam I mean water based enamel emulsion paint is not a sustainable because even their emulsion, even though paint is water based, the emulsion based on the monomers, which is a product of petroleum industry. Whereas in alkyd based, the oil, what is being used, the oil length is 60, 70 in long oil alkyd. The oil is a byproduct. Bio so, if you look at from the sustainability point of view, some of the solvent based paints can be more sustainable than the water based paints, keeping VOCs apart. Now, when we use such kind of products, <coughs> the fundamental, very fundamental, we need to see that simply picking any renewable raw material is not going to suffice our need. We have to pick the raw the material which has a non conflict with the feedstock or the food crops. Otherwise, there will be scarcity. For example, even water based products is not going to be a sustainable product. There is a scarcity of drinking water in the world. How can we put the water in paint for industrial application when there is a shortage of water? So, I do not, so I mean though, though they are healthy, they are less hazardous, but they are, uh, these products are not 
sustainable products. We need to think very differently about sustainability. Now, what is the complexity? There are high complexity of green chemistry molecules available. For example, the uh, um, the chlorophyll available in the plants, it is a green color, we can extract that chlorophyll and just simply use that in the paint. But difficulty because the molecules, natural molecules are so complex, it is very difficult and costly process to extract them in a natural. Let us say the rose, if I want to put some rose color natural, is it available in volume to put? For academic study it is ok, but it is not possible. If everybody started putting where is the facility available for us to grow so much of roses or any product bio that is the challenge and secondly these molecules we cannot modify custom modify for our usage that is the even bigger challenge in front of us these are challenges but we need to seek answers for that so the time consuming process is there then high production cost and capital expenditure is very high so today even sustainable product meaning it is double cost affordability is very high and then that is the reason people go for the more hazardous let it be it is I am paying less. So, these are the challenges in front of scientists. Now, what has happened when we review simple example VOC reduction in the colorant. Now, what the VOC is meaning glycol containing product which have low molecular weight and low boiling point. Simple reduction has poses a very uh, good challenges in front of paint industry even as a colorant manufacturer when we reduce the glycol percentage from the colorant, the colorant dries, it dispenses through the machine, the nozzle gets dries, so many problems are there. And then in India, it is such a geography that we have a minus degree temperature in the north and then also during the summer temperature goes up to 45, 48 degrees C in Rajasthan and desert anywhere. So, so much of diversity and then humectant plays very uh, crucial role in keeping the color moist and open time very high. It disturbs the rheology profile of the colorant. It does not get accurately dispensed and we, we struggled 5 years for replacing glycol uh, with something else which is more sustainable and which we can reduce the VOCs of our colors today. But I will say you that we offer a zero VOC product. Similarly, the alkyl phenol ethoxylates, they come from the surfactants. These are harmful to the aquatic life. Now, replacing alkyl phenol, why this alkyl phenol is there? First of all, we need to think what are the advantages, why they come into existence? Because of their aromatic structure, they give very good dispersion properties. Today, the aliphatic, we have much more progressed on that. Even aliphatic structure surfactants are available. But initially, the stability of the dispersion was a challenge versus aromatic structure. But today, this, this uh, I mean, there were, there were problems 5 years ago, but today we have a solution. Similarly, what the challenges I pose in front of you, we would find a, of course the, the solutions for that. And also the compatibility, colorant is such a uh, thing that we make, it goes to 10 different customers with different profile of products and still the expectation is that the colorant should show the very good compatibility with every product. Same is the case with the biocides. Today the biocide also there are many label free biocide that is the demand from the western world. Many things are banned to use the formal diode and everything that uh, those are even I would say large generation biocides. But everything has to be label free and today much more evolved technologies have come. Dr. Pathar is here expert into that uh, segment, he can uh, throw more light on it. But Label free product is something is the demand because everything has to be declared on the container of the paint that this product contain these segments and nobody would like to have some such kind of hazard declarations. What is happening on the pigment side? <laughs> Even the pigments, natural available pigments, pigments are synthetic. We used to get a naturally occurred pigments, iron oxides before. Everything, what is happening, you know the trend. Whatever used to be there 50 years ago, the trend is coming back again. Even if you food, if you see that the organic food and this uh, unpolished rice and everything, it was there before. Because of the mass production, we take on, take on the shortcuts and we made it more attractive visually by look, everything and then again we are going back. Same thing is happening with the chemistry also. The 2K chem, clear coat, base coat because of the performance, again we are going back to the monocoat application. But 
with the today's perspective of technology, we should go back to the original concepts. The original concepts were very good with advanced technology, but so similarly, yes, uh, with the bio pigments also, the bio succinic root pigments are available slowly, slowly coming in the market. Uh, but there are some challenges. Some microorganism and algae root manufactured pigments are also they are very popular in cosmetic applications. Instead of the thylacinin, the phycocyanin pigments, they are popular. So very good work is happening on that front as well. So some other challenges are there, wide compatibility of colorant with the uh, wide paint uh, systems, then longer canister stability, freeze thaw stability, uh, no sedimentation, no synergies, everything uh, by incorporating these challenges, still the, the expectations remain the same. And what we took that four pillars of our uh, philosophy, durability, sustainability, efficiency and innovation, those are the four drivers that we work upon with this philosophy. Some of our sustainable color offerings that I would say that today we cater to uh, uh, paint and coating industry, majority, we have a power point of sale tinting system, we have now industrial tinting system running since last 20 years, we have very good color solution for wood coating systems, floor coating systems and uh, uh, not only for paint and coating but also we are very strong today into selling colors for printing inks, for textile digital printing applications, for home care, personal care. Uh, I can proudly say that the light boy red comes from our color, the Santur orange comes from our, our color, Rexona green is our color, Hamam green is our color. So it all goes, I mean we are touching life every day through the color. Even the textile viscose fiber, the color that we supply to uh, manufacturers, uh, every day once you start your day from the morning till you go to the bed, everything that we are touching every day life through the color. Uh, cosmetic applications we are very big into. So some of the new products that we introduced recently, I just quickly cover up this. <laughs> we are coming very big into the automotive section now because that is one of the industry that is growing very fast. Cap compatible products, Super Jet Black is one of the highest jettest black available in the world and this has been approved by all the multinational automotive companies. We have started supplying to them. Probably what the vehicle, black vehicle you are driving would have the dispersion coming from Saujana's house. Uh, so this is some of the technical specs of it, I can skip that. Even the candy red, what we have done, uh, red 177 pigment, uh, the MG Hector red uh, color, the red color very bright candy red and mo most of the cycle industry, this is very popular. The dye, because of the hazardous nature, dye based product is replaced with the pigmented one and this has attract, gained very much uh, attraction from the industry. So these are all cap compatible going for the refinish market, OEM market and we have been approved by the globally renowned companies and they have started using into end application. So packaging also that uh, when I say sustainability, it's not only about the product, it's also about the packaging. The plastic, HDP, PVC, LDP, we explored all of these. PET is the one which is more, not very widely used for paint packaging, mostly HDP is used but HDP's recirculation rate is hardly 23 percent whereas PET is 65 percent recyclable at the same quality. When we recycle HDP, it's just down cycle. It means it goes one, cycle, one step down in quality, PET is not. So we have also taken initiative to make our products PET based. These are some of the that we calculated actually carbon footprint, what all our activities and how much we actually emit the carbon. These are some initiatives we have taken as a company level, as a contribution not based on the regulations by our own to contribute in the health of the world, right? And living up to our commitments, our colors are Green Pro certified. They are uh, approved by the IGBC, Indian Green Build Council. They are sub certified to use on the green buildings, okay? And then nature has sustained itself. We believe on that. Nature has sustained itself for billions of years. So also the industry can sustain it. Thank you very much. Any questions I would like to take up on? Yes. Yes, we do. For what application? Yes, we have resin. Universal or resin free only? No resin, yes. Right. Today we have no resin, even we no solvent. Solvent free colors. 
yet they are free flowable. And very proudly I can say I have not shown up, but very first year in 2019 when we got associated with Tata's, we got an Tata Innovista award. Those who are into that pattern, I mean that segment, they would know. It's an innovative partner of the year award. It's not only with the Tata Motors only, but it's from the group, Tata Chemical, TCS, Tata Motors and Tata Steel. Among that, they shortlist some of the projects. We got shortlisted in first round, second round, third round and final round. We won the first award in 2019 by Tata's. Thank you. They are available, they are available, even industrial coating point of sale are available. Uh, our colors are machine dispensable and we supply to paint companies only. So that is the, if you even look, I mean, I don't know whether it is appropriate or not, but Asian Paints entire wood coating technology, 2000 machines are based on our colors. They are all industrial protective system in the market, uh, machine dispensable system, they are based on our colors. Only thing that we are not into the retail market, we are into B2B so that you would not come to know uh, whether we are there or not. But yes, machine tintable, point of sale tinting, industrial colors are available with us. Color means that already uh, usable color they are coming. They are not ready. Uh, we are not tinting them before use on them. Mm -hmm. so, so probably the manufacturer is using the colors. Yeah. Yes, possible, quite possible. Yes. All right then. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. I would like to, yes. Dr. Rahul Gulkani, please. Sir, I will fix it. I will fix it. I will fix it. Yes, sir. And Mr. Satya Prakash? Now we'll take a short break for tea, uh, just about 20 minutes, so that uh, we will be on time.
welcome back now we'll start our next technical session uh, i would like to call upon dr harish agarwal to get uh, mr ujwal kunte dr pathare and mr vikas dangat to come on the dais please Now, after tea, the first presentation is from Mr. Kunte, Durocrate Engineering. He is expert in testing procedure for the concrete construction chemicals. So, in our uh, this topic, we have included construction chemical also this time. So, he will give you the guideline how to test the construction material. If you have any question regarding construction chemical, you can ask him. So, I'll request. Mr. Kunte to present his paper. Hello. 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 Yeah, this is working. Good evening. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Singh for uh, inviting me here. Uh, when I came here, I feel little, uh, you know, out of place, you know, because uh, they are all here chemical technologists and I am an odd man out uh, civil engineer. Uh, but since the topic is related to construction, just a brief background, uh, we have a testing lab called Durocrete. Uh, we established in uh, 80, uh, 98 and uh, we have uh, been uh, in this testing business for last 25 years. We are into testing as well as inspection. So uh, we have testing labs in Pune, Mumbai, and Nashik. And we test over 60, 70 different materials. We are accredited under ISO 17025 by International Accreditation Service USA. And we have an international uh, partnership with ACTS. They hold equity participation in our company. And uh, they are leading experts in testing and inspection in the uh, Middle East. You know, they have worked on very large projects. They are working on large projects like Riyadh International Airport, Jeddah International Airport, Doha Metro. And they are also testing consultants for uh, the world's tallest building that is under construction in Jeddah, which is one kilometer tall uh, Kingdom Towers. So uh, this is just a small background. And then we have an inspection company called CQRA, uh, where we have around 200 engineers and we are into t inspection across India related to construction. So when we talk about uh, construction, you know, every aspect of our construction today is touched by construction chemicals. You know, it, the uh, role played by construction chemicals is so overwhelming. Whether you talk about concrete, plasters, mortars, any material, it has got construction chemicals. And uh, the world, you know, the business is getting uh, shifted from seller's market to a buyer's market, so performance really counts. And uh, it is very important that these materials should be tested for quality, because in today's world, uh, you know, implications can be very, very high. You know, we are in a rare world where buyers are very educated and, you know, uh, people can really sue companies also. So let us look at, uh, you know, why we need uh, testing. Now, first is that there's extreme prolif uh, you know, proliferation of products. You know, you have for any product, you have international players, you have national players, local players, and how do you choose the correct products? Then, of course, you have to assure the quality of the product, and uh, you have to continuously, new products are coming up in the market. You know, I'll discuss about some of them in my presentation. It should give confidence to the buyer. So buyer also is doing a lot of testing. So uh, it has to come from both manufacturer as the buyer, as well as the buyer. And of course, uh, you have to have a continuous uh, you know, cycle of improving your products. So that cannot happen without testing. So with this, you know, we move to the 
you know, next uh, this thing problem that we have. A lot of people, of course, here we have a lot of uh, manufacturers, but a lot of people rely on uh, manufacturer's test certificate. But, uh, you know, I would always uh, give a lot of importance to third party testing, you know, because of inherent problems related with uh, testing yourself, testing it yourself. There's a huge conflict of interest. You know, many a times the testing quality is not assured. Sometimes, you know, the labs are not accredited. The environment is not there. Then, you know, sometimes the testing is not specifically for a particular, uh, you know, lot. You know, like in the cement industry, when you get a cement test certificate, it is for the entire week. So it is an average report of a week that they give you. So that does not tell you exactly what is the quality of your product unless you test it yourself. Then, you know, I mentioned about this conflict of interest and rarely I have seen, uh, you know, manufacturers, if you go and uh, inspect their testing, you don't see failures anywhere. You know, rarely I have seen that, you know, uh, failures are recorded and some corrective action is taken. So basically it is used for giving a certificate of conformance. So that's why we have to get into third party testing, which brings confidence to the buyer and gives, uh, you know, a lot of uh, confidence to the even the supplier also. Now, I have put some quotes in between, you know, just to make it little interesting. So Edward, Ms. Dr. Edward Deming was, you know, pioneer in uh, quality management. And he said that learning is not compulsory, neither is survival. And you know, this is another uh, pioneer, you know, uh, in quality. If you don't know what the defect level is, how do you know when to get mad? So this means that we have to do regular testing and quality control. So let us look at the types of quality control. One is lab testing versus in-situ testing. So, you know, lab, of course, all of us know, but uh, many a times some products give greater confidence if they are tested on the site. You know, for example, I'll just, uh, you know, we were doing some testing for uh, PP fibers long time back. And uh, of course, there were a lot of lab tests, the performance of those fibers on concrete, it's how it improves its wear resistance or its uh, toughness or other properties, flexural strength, whether it had any, you know, change that was tested. But during the course of testing, we found that, you know, it made the mix very cohesive. So which meant that when the product was used in a plaster when it would be applied it would you know you would see that when a mason is applying the plaster there would be a lot of uh, rebound loss you know it falls off so we felt that since this made the product sticky the rebound loss would be reduced okay so but how do you test it so we created an environment on the project and we actually measured the quantity and we created different you know sets and we uh, ask them to, uh, you know, apply the um, a mortar in a certain conditions and we collected the material that was falling and that data was documented and we were able to prove that it reduced the rebound loss by almost 40%. So, which is a huge, uh, you know, benefit for the product. So, they were not certainly going to initially selling it based on that, but then it became an additional point in their brochure. So then, of course, we uh, do testing as per the prescribed standards. Then you can also develop certain tests based on uh, performance. You know, I recall, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, you know, we had done some testing for LK long, long time back when you are doing silicones. And that time the tests were not developed, you know, the water repellency test was required. So that time we were, you know, we, 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 we were not able to create the exact uh, standard. But we built the test over here as a comparative testing. So that, you know, we, that angle of, uh, you know, we created a concrete substrate and then we raised it to different angles. Then we injected a liquid, you know, uh, 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 specific quantity of liquid. And we found out at which angle, you know, it was flowing off. Then how much quantity was collected, how much was it, you know, retained, how much of it was absorbed. So all those things, you know, you can do and this creates a lot of confidence amongst the buyer than, you know, many a times the actual, uh, you know, lab environmental testing. So then, you know, there's always a method, you know, sometimes uh, in many products, uh, standards are not either available, acceptable standards, or they are, uh, the range is very wide. So then you can do a comparative testing. The comparative testing can be done with lab versus control or versus competitors. So these are different standards, I'm sure you're all aware, which we, you know, uh, uh, use. 
Now, you know, yeah, okay, do you know who this person is? You know, we should all be grateful to him, especially in the testing field. He is Mr. Sam Pitroda. He was scientific as advisor to uh, Prime Minister. And, you know, what this person did was that he made all the standards free in India. Can you imagine this? Today, you can download any BI standard from the net free of cost. And earlier, I used to recall when I started the testing lab, for every test, I had to go to the BIS office. There used to be, there used to, you, you had to pay. And they, you know, they, 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 each standard has got three or four other reference standards. Then you realize, and they realize that the mechanism created to sell the standards was costing them more than the revenue generated. But nobody thought about it for 20 years. And this guy felt that, you know, this is something if you are ushering a quality revolution in the country, What's the fun in, you know, charging and making the process so difficult? Why not, you know, make it free through internet? So this is a big development in our country. So let us look at, you know, now the certain chemical additives that uh, we use, you know, uh, integral waterproofing, uh, you know, integral uh, chemicals that, that are added in concrete and mortars. So these are some of the uh, different chemicals that we regularly use. Now I must say that concrete is the largest man-made material in the world. Okay, and if you look at the second largest material, man-made material, I would look at it as a plasticizer. Because today no concrete is possible without plasticizer. Imagine all the concrete that is happening, gone are the days when people used to do only cement, water and aggregates. It, now I, today I call it, it is not concrete technology, it is admixture technology. So that is the volume. And of course, we need to have a specific tests. So I divided between, you know, chemicals that are added inside integral and surface applied. So these are various, you know, waterproofing chemical coats, water repellents, you know, curing compounds. Now this, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about this because this uh, is very interesting. Adhesives, mold release agents. Mold release agents are very important. You know, they improve the, uh, you know, life of the molds. They give a better surface. And I just, when I heard your lecture about uh, silicones with that methyl, uh, you know, chain, they are, they, probably you should explore whether they could be used as a mold, mold release agents. Very, very good application. Then paints, of course, you are all experts in it. So, and of course, these are different categories that we use in construction. I'll skip this. Now, when we look at testing of plasticizers, you know, basically, of course, we do test some physical pa parameters uh, like, you know, specific gravity, solids, viscosity, solid content, viscosity, pH, etc. The chemical parameters, you know, you have to use, uh, you know, this uh, particular methodology basically for quality control, you know, because uh, we are, all these are water soluble for a construction site to know whether consistently that quality is, you know, being supplied by the manufacturer, you know, he has to resort to have, he needs to have some kind of, you know, uh, methodology. So how do you test uh, performance of uh, plasticizers? So basically, plasticizers, what they do is they change the rheology of concrete. You know, they increase the plasticity without addition of water. So we have to use minimum water and it will, it, they, they are surface uh, re, uh, resurfactants, you know, what do you call They dispersion agents. So uh, you use less water and you increase the strength, you increase the durability and uh, get various other, you know, uh, plastic properties in concrete. So the, uh, the, then, you know, of course, you have to check it during the plastic stage and the hardened stage. Both uh, tests are there. So I will just come to, uh, you know, this particular uh, marsh cone test for testing compatibility. I'm sure most of you uh, must be aware of this. We check, you know, we check how quickly we put a liter of uh, cement uh, and uh, water grout, you know, with a very low water cement ratio and we check the time taken, uh, you know, for that uh, one liter to flow and we compare with different dosages and we find the optimum dosage. So for every construction chemical, there's a threshold limit, which is the minimum where beyond which it is effective and there's a maximum beyond which it is not so effective. So you have to determine both these two ends and then you have to, you know, have intermediate points and then plot the most ideal one for you, the ideal dosage that you require for that particular uh, mix. So when, when we say, uh, you know, uh, when we have to test concrete, we need to many a times design experiments, you know. So you have to decide the control condition, which is always without the additives, decide the variable to be measured, decide the dosages of additives. You know, I'll just quickly run through this because 
and work out the number of trials and get results. And then you can extrapolate for determ determining optimum dosages. Now, just an example that uh, one of the measures that we use uh, for checking the rheology of concrete mix is slump. So we have a control slump over here. I've, I'm increasing the dosage. This uh, dosage is by weight of cement. Okay. So uh, we see how, what is the change in uh, you know the uh, slump that we observe, and then we can extrapolate for which slump how much dosage is required, and then you can compare different admixtures. You know uh, which is more effective. Then there are retarders. You know because these days batching plant is at one corner. You know you you need two to three hours of retardation, slump retention. So you need to extend the time of use. So that is done by a retarder so these are you know various ways in we which, which we test retarders then the setting time is tested by this so performance testing is also required here to test whether the admixture does not reduce the strength of course it is not supposed to reduce the strength but this is something that has to be verified you know so you have to check with the especially with the maximum dosage that you have sometimes you know excessive dosage can uh, change the hydration process so much that it gives a permanent retardation to the concrete. And higher dosages can result sometimes in a slight drop in strength. One more you know, quality saying, quality is always made in the boardroom and worker can only deliver lower quality but cannot deliver quality better than the system would allow. This is, okay. So apart from testing of strength, these days, you know, sorry, this, these days testing for durability or permeability of concrete is becoming very important because life of the building depends on permeability. So these are the three tests that we do, especially when you're using any of these, you know, waterproofing, uh, water reducing agents, or sometimes waterproofing by crystallization. A lot of new materials are coming in which are, you know, supposed to increase, uh, reduce the uh, permeability of concrete, improve the durability. So these are some of the tests. So just a minute. So this is where we put a pressure on the concrete, uh, concrete specimen. Actually, this is aspect ratio is not right. The uh, pressure is almost 10 bar and uh, till there's a water that is being collected becomes constant. So there's a constant discharge and uh, lower end you see this K equal to Q upon A into TH. So this is Darcy's law basically. So Darcy's law you calculate the coefficient of permeability. So for different dosages you can calculate the coefficient of permeability for the same water cement ratio. So then there's a water penetration test, again, another test where, uh, you know, you put it under pressure for 72 hours at 500 kPa and uh, you check to what depth, you cut the, uh, you know, cylinder or the concrete specimen and check what is the penetration of the concrete under that pressure. And then you can do comparative study with different dosages, control versus different dosages, what is the depth of penetration. So... This is another test where, you know, RCPT, which is uh, chloride penetration, more important where uh, steel is being used because steel corrodes normally. That is why life of the building is affected. It is not the concrete. It is steel is the culprit. So it uh, again, it is related with the permeability of concrete. So you have on one surface sodium chloride, another, so you're creating a cell over here and you allow under 60 volts a charge that is passed. And in six hours, you find out how much charge has been passed. And it is proportional to the porosity that is there in the concrete. So, you know, these are the, you measure it in coulombs. So again, when you do these, these are the tests where you can compare different, uh, you know, mixes, you can compare different uh, chemicals. Then, of course, testing of curing compound. Now, this is something uh, very interesting I want to touch upon. You know, curing compound, concrete, all, all of you know, require curing and phenomenal amount of construction, what, uh, you know, water is used. We are wasting a very, you know, you, such a valuable resource. And for seven days, you know, you will see people are supposed to put water on the concrete. And it is actually not needed, you know, because you're putting already enough water required for hydration inside the concrete. You know, the water required for hydration in concrete is much, much less than what water cement ratios you are using. So objective of curing is not to supply water, but to retain the water that is added at the time of mixing and not, allow, not allowing it to escape. So these curing compounds are creating an impermeable barrier. It's simple and, uh, you know, not allowing that water to escape. Now the catch is that this curing compound has to get re be removable because you are going to apply another plaster or something on that. So you should be able to easily remove it. 
otherwise it, the next plaster will not you know it will fall off so that's the only catch but the uh, problem in our industry is that uh, in spite of the fact that this is going to save them lots of money lots of labor and it is better but the penetration of this particular uh, product in the industry is hardly uh, i wouldn't say more than 5 to 10% and i would say that it is 90% sites need to use this now one of the reasons is lack of confidence you know because lot of uh, manufacturer there each comes with it nobody knows they apply and then you know everybody and the tests are not so you know uh, 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 the, the test design do not give you that kind of confidence you know i'll i'll share that uh, you know test you know what they do is uh, you as per the astm you know uh, th th 309 water loss is check you have a concrete specimen that is kept you know in 72 hours in a cabinet at uh, you know 38 degree and 35 rh and you have to check you know how much is the water loss and uh, uh, so it should be less than 55 so this doesn't you know give confidence to the uh, you know buyer actually so in real this is another quote that we have so you know you, uh, we, we could design an experiment you know which gives confidence to the buyer so we have to think beyond you know the standards so what we generally do is we say the cast 18 cubes three sets of six cubes apply for one set you cure in water which is the standard thing second set you apply you cure in room temperature you apply the uh, 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 you apply the curing compound cure in room temperature uh, uh, with uh, you know 27 degrees and relative humidity of 65% because you can't compare because uh, you know you have to have a controlled environment for this so in normally i have said 65 because every testing lab has got a cement testing setup which has this uh, 65 degree centigrade uh, environment so and set th 3 is you cure in room temperature uh, you know uh, without application of uh, curing compound so you can check all the three you know with 100% cured you know with the curing compound cured in air uh and uh, third is uh, cured in air without the curing compound and when you get these results these are something that will give confidence to the buyer then we have bonding agents now bonding agents we check for pot life uh, you know tax free time you know now many a times i find that people give lot of importance to uh, bond strength tensile strength and these properties and first two according to me are far more critical and they are so easily tested you know problem is that uh, many a times why these bonding agents fail is they don't have adequate pot life or adequate tax free time you know because when the when you apply a bonding agent when it is sticky you are supposed to apply the next layer now you have to really understand the construction process on the site and see how much time is actually lost you know how much time a actual process takes and while checking you know people don't see that you know i want a tax free time of 2 hours or 3 hours many uh, and there is no standard for this unfortunately so many uh, manufacturers come at tax free time of 30 minutes 45 minutes question is is it adequate so so these are some of the tests you know which uh, we have uh, you can have direct tension you can apply the bonding agent over here so you apply the bonding agent over here apply put a concrete you know mortar surface over here then this is a epoxy uh, you know adhesive that you can put this is a plate and you pull it and then you know you can see what is the adhesion strength or second is this you know slant shear bond test where you know you have you cast this uh, in a standard cylinder in a mold this portion that you have is a old substrate the other portion so you cast a concrete you know in old uh, you know uh, this uh, the earlier material on which the substrate is going to come this is the new one and there is a bonding agent over here and you apply force over here and it will split Ten minutes. Okay. So these are some of the uh, ready mix plasters are commonly in use. You have this setting time, workable time, correction time. Now this workable time and correction time are pretty important. Again, we give a lot of importance to this flexural, compressive, other pro properties. But workable, many you know ready mix plasters fail on site because they don't have adequate workable time. Because the mason when he mixes, you know he'll require at least two hours. to mix it and if it loses its uh, properties you will not get the benefit so these are some of the strength requirements so when you uh, I, i was talking about adhesion of mortars when you do it you know if if it is effective if the, the, this is a case one failure where this is the mortar 
and this is a substrate on which you are you know putting that mortar so if this is where you applied that uh, you know so if this fails over here this adhesion of this mortar is not good it should have a good adhesion properties so if this is there then this is okay because it is failing within the mortar not at the surface okay so this is okay and this is also okay you know it is the mortar the, the stronger than the substrate so substrate has you know uh, taken off this is another saying so then there is there is a lot of uh, testing related with tile tile fixing adhesives uh, clear, clear, water cleanability open time adjustability now these are again things open time is after you have mixed it you know till how much time you can fix that time uh, fix that tile and adjustability is another parameter that after you have fixed it you know sometimes you know you need to make a correction over there okay in the, suppose it is not in level so to what time you can make that correction and then there's shear bond compressive strength so this is a shear bond test you know where if you see over here there's a load applied and this is a common you know area overlap area between two tiles and you check at what force it fails there's a apparatus that is needed for this sometimes you have you can use a pull out uh, you know testing machine also so when we talk about testing of preformed membranes uh, uh, waterproofing uh, you know either you have liquid applied and preformed so these are some of the things that we check you know in uh, as per astm d 751 so you have the standard uh, uh, standard uh, membrane you know which is 4 uh, inch by 6 inch and uh, th these are the jaws and you pull it in a low capacity utm now it is very important that when you test it in a utm the capacity of that utm is very critical you know it should the testing should be the test result should be between 15 to 85% of the capacity of the machine always then you know, when you test these membranes you know you have you are going to test basically the elongation that you are getting and the strength of course but then you know if you look at this this has got a lower strength and uh, you know higher elongation this has got so generally when you put a fabric reinforcement you will always have a reduction in the elongation and you will have a increase in the strength so there is this adhesion test for uh, you know membranes now this adhesion test is as per astm d6677 this is very interesting this is uh, this doesn't require any specific instruments you can just cut a x you know and uh, try to remove that material with a knife and they have given you know how you can rate that uh, adhesion quality so it's very easy to uh, you know this rating is there you can easily rate it uh, how good it is this is another saying every problem has two solutions bhag lo or bhag lo so liquid waterproofing membranes again resistant these are different tests that uh, we do elongation at break resistance to water pressure tack free time then adhesion to concrete crack bridging ability is very important and of course resistance to uv so this is a spe specific crack bridging test which is very important as per uh, you know uh, the astm it has uh, it is there you know now uh, i used to always wonder that how come uh, you know manufacturers uh, give a 10 year warranty how can a product uh, you know be how can he be so sure but when you go into the test you know then you realize that how stringent the test has been designed you know you apply so here what you have is two blocks are uh, you know joined together to create that crack you are applying a membrane over the here and you put this you cure this for 21 days normally and then 7 days you blow hot 70 degree air on it okay so that is a i used to wonder why so every time you want to recreate aging process you have to the general uh, procedure is to raise the temperature okay so you blow that hot air and then after 7 days you bring the temperature down to minus 26 so at lower temperatures the you know film becomes very brittle and then you pull it apart by 3.2 mm and then you test whether you know it is cracking or not so i'm sure if something passes this uh, a manufacturer should be able to give that kind of warranty so then there is a water penetration test you know uh, where you can uh, test the hydrostatic pressure test is there so these are some of the uh, you know different tests that we do so this is one quote from mr ratan tata all of us do not have equal talent yet all of us have equal opportunity to develop our talents and 
Phil Crosby, another uh, you know great uh, person, quality. He said that quality is free. The expense of quality is non-conformance. So you know, quality control and quality assurance are defined were defined formally by Phil Crosby, and they're very important. So basically, it is verification process. This is verification, and this is giving preventive measures. You know, creating so that the product doesn't fail in the first place. So. I would always suggest that go by de simple things. You know what was invented by Demings hundred years back still works. PDCA cycle, where this, you know, actually, uh, P plan, do, check, act. Actually, it is like this. So, so this check is testing. This is where reconfirmation you have to test and act means standardization. Once you have got the results, do it across. So I would say that regular testing is very important to uh, assure quality of products. Choose appropriate testing methods to suit the site conditions. Test methods can be modified or they can be developed. It is not necessary that you have to follow a standard. Uh, even uh, the 17,025 allows you to develop tests and you know to uh, class, uh, you know put it across. Uh, use of comparative testing is a very effective tool for quality control. Thank you. We have little bit time. Our third speaker is not there. So I'll just add up to Mr. Kunte's presentation. He touched up a very important valid point for the curing compound. This curing compounds basically they are produced by two methods. One is the polymeric curing compound. Second one is the wax based curing compound. So what happened in the case of polymeric curing compound, you have to take some alkates, polymer alkates, take some emulsifiers, mix it with emulsifier, add some aluminum, leafing aluminum paste, and you dilute it to 60-40 ratio and apply, the film will be formed and the compact structure will be there, it will be sealed completely, so there will be no evaporation of water. So this will serve the purpose and you will get the polymeric curing compound. The another one is the water based wax based compound. So in that case you have to use the acrylic emulsion. Acrylic emulsion, SBR latex emulsion you can take or you can take an elastomeric emulsion. Wax emulsion is required there, the dosage is up to 10%. Again use the aluminum paste, some emulsifier and dilute it with water. Waxes are having tendency to migrate on the surface. So they will come on the surface and they will form a ceiling to the surface. And you, the water cannot be evaporated and you will get the effect with the curing compound. I think I am right. So this is the curing compound. So, yeah. Please. This is what I learned about uh, 40, 45 years back, somewhere in 1975-76. I'm talking from those perspective and then modifying today with the today's perspective. What is concrete? What is cement? How does cement uh, really become hard? What is a chemical process over there? It is a silicate bond. It is a silicate bond. How do we get the strong silicate bond, which is three-dimensional? What is the agent involved in it? Carbon dioxide. It is CO2 which cures. Now you said that uh, uh, people keep on adding water. You know why they are adding water? Just to dissolve the atmospheric carbon dioxide so that it, can, it is available now to the concrete. It's a vehicle that water throwing is actually you are picking up the carbon dioxide, throwing it on the concrete. That carbon dioxide initiates the reaction with the with the silicate bond, silicate. It, till that point, it is not silicate. It, it, it is a, a, a monomeric form of silica. And then it gets crosslink with H2CO3, which is getting generated. Now, if there is excessive H2CO3, the, the rebar inside 
gets affected because it. So again, when he said that there is an aluminum paste which is required, what does it really do? That aluminum paste, when you put in alkaline media, it generates carbon dioxide. It generates carbon dioxide. Wax coating is there so that whatever water is inside, it doesn't come out. And the curing process completes thereafter. There are a lot of, lot of points in your lecture. Sorry, I mean, am I right on, the, on this platform? Uh, you looked at it from the civil engineer's point of view. I will translate it into chemical point of view. Because the moment we understand how to translate into chemical point of view, the people who are working in a construction chemical will definitely have a concrete idea. Concrete now. That concrete is different. Concrete idea how to generate the material for, that, for the uh, uh, construction industry. Because construction is now the process. It is very important today. And if anything goes wrong, everything is going wrong. Uh, you touched also upon epoxies and kind of thing. There are a lot of uh, issues. Uh, people do pay attention to the pot life. That is important. Today, on the very last surface, you require large pot life. Otherwise, you can't complete it. So people have to pay the attention to the pot life. Uh, if, if the uh, surface area is too large, and if you have to sell it, if the pot life is 25 and 30 minutes, be sure that everything is going to get paste. Right? So you require very large pot life. Now the problem of very large pot life is the bonding can also get delayed. Can get delayed. So somewhere we have to strike the uh, midpoint of it. And that midpoint actually, how to decide it, that depends upon if you are using epoxy on epoxy equivalent, which is important. On the curing agent of the epoxy, whether it is amine or whether it is amide based, right? And the play between the two, that will define it. So next time, possibly, we can add up all those possible points inside your uh, testing method so that people like us who are blind about it can understand what exactly to do, right? Uh, possibly, you and me will make a presentation again jointly. Sure. So you put a slide, I'll put the chemical slide next to it. Right? Then, then it becomes a celebration of quantity of knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Don't get offended. <laughs> now, fortunately, the next speaker is not there, but I'll take a little longer time. Pardon me? How to generate CO2 to get better silicate? There are agents. This is a very good question. Uh, you see, don't uh, uh, depend anymore on this kind of a process. There are now chemical processes to generate CO2 in the concrete itself when the concrete is wet. It's my patent. I'll come back to you. <laughs> Sir, uh, what about the seismic protection? Uh, well, uh, again, he talked about flexural strength, bonding strength, both. Uh, this seismic protection comes from both, right? Again, because there is a, a modulus of elasticity, and uh, which is uh, parallel to the surface. Uh, compression strength is vertical to the surface. Now, if you are trying to increase this and trying to decrease this, again, the concrete is gone. Because the two forces are in opposite direction. One is vertical, one is uh, horizontal. Uh, if, if you plot exactly the graph of it, then you, remember, then you know where you have to touch. The designers of the structures actually actually do that actually do that and then they decide what is the seismic resistance what is the compression strength what is the tens tensile strength what is the flexural strength now all these things should be transferred in the form of chemistry in the form of the formulations right so it is just not that okay make some material over there make some super plasticizer add it inside it doesn't give the concrete it doesn't give the concrete Say you've got a 100 meter long uh, big slab. And if you're going to literally construct it, by the time you go to that end to put the concrete, this end will start drying. So there will be variation in the strength across the length and across the, across the entire surface. Something like a 1,000 meter block. 1,000 meter block is not easy to cast in concrete. It's not easy to. Today, the major problem of the bridges is that, that how you, do it, how you did the construction. 
and nobody is helping anybody on the site what exactly is to be done which is the major lacuna right because if you see today we leave the uh, ready made block put it as a slab right the block is 100 meter long today it, it is a difficult aspect if it is not properly constructed this is one of the reasons why the road breaks when the, the when the contractor does the work he has been told that we want to finish the road within so much time he doesn't any time so he wants to do fast work so fast setting concrete so you have to first start with the different types of the cements why 40 cements and why 44 cement why 52 cement why 56 cements who talks about it can can all these additives go in any cement it, they can't so there is somewhere some system now what differs what differs what makes the cement grades different and according to that cement grade are we making the construction materials construction chemicals this is the main subject of this particular industry and unfortunately it is not addressed at all so let's do it a special session on it one day right so that uh, we are all layman right but by only by this kind of thing we will learn what what could be done this is my perspective i may be wrong if i am wrong excuse me right but we'll correct it one more case study i'll give there is one more case study he was talking about the siloxone and silane and siloxin so the combination actually what happened there was an a complaint from pokhran nepal pokhran there was heavy leakage in the bridge so the question comes how to stop that leakage so the combination of silane siloxin plus tpa thermoplastic acrylic resin this was given in the very diluted form and v was made and injected inside a very stable curing compound very stable curing uh, results were obtained and there was absolutely no leakage so such type of case studies are also there now please continue yeah just the last reference sure. tunnel collapse very recent thing very recent thing we had learned about lot we read about lot but nobody talked whether while making the tunnel where there was what we call as a injection around the tunnel what we call as a fixing the pockets right which was not done on that tunnel and that is why it collapsed uh in mumbai there is a tunnel which is 100 feet uh, 20 feet deep mumbai's water supply is through concrete tunnel it starts just behind uh, glaxo the first stage goes to ruparel college second stage starts from ruparel college to borivli third stage starts from uh, glaxo that is that portion to malbaril that tunnel is 10 meter 10 10 feet diameter it is 120 feet below the soil so when they made it i was involved into that particular project way back in uh, 85 to 95 95 almost 10 years it was going on right the major problem is when they started doing tunnel the sea water started coming in so it has to be stopped you have to also do the concreting around that there is a, a there is a complete uh, shuttering which was done shuttering can move only in one direction it can't come back once you put the concrete around and the sea water was seeping in this was amazing work done by bmc which nobody knows now this kind of a technology should have been used in that tunnel over there this technology was used again in the new washi construction washi bridge which was made in those days in the morning it, it was mentioned that the uh, director general of roads and bridges finally issued uh, this kind of a compulsion and now it has become a subject. You will see each and every bridge getting coated. What should be the coating material? What should be the paint? It has to be defined. It is defined. Whether we stick to it or not, I do not know, but it's a big avenue today for the paint industry. Big avenue today. No big industry is supplying that paint. No big industry. No big suppliers. All the three paint manufacturers not making those kind of paints. Anyway, now I come back to my presentation. Uh, I avoided uh, talking about my company for one simple reason that the subject which is assigned to me was done by him. It was not a subject chosen by me. So I realized that possibly that is a demand. 
and because it is a demand then i have to give a lot of attention and lot of time to it so can we go to the directly my presentation, presentation. we'll talk about melzer little later possibly you all know about melzer those who do not know will come talk about it so the topic which is given to me is new general antimicrobial preservatives for coatings it surprised me to be very honest what it indicated to me i think i'll have to come stand over here because i'm not used to stand in one place and talk no, about it's it okay. I'll, I'll do it for you. yeah so <laughs> click it so expectation is your general microbial uh, antimicrobials are required the silent message seems to say can we have better antimicrobials that means in the minds of everybody there is a doubt whether the antimicrobials which we are using today in paints coatings are correct or we require something new it has given me a big big message that look there is a kind of unrest kind of a, uh, 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 what i would say ki uh, resistance or kind of a doubt whether what i am using is right what we have been doing is correct and so everybody thinks that okay let's go for the new generation not that in every field there is new generation so new generation over here so what really went wrong if you want to make a new generation by side it's a very long work no new technical active ingredient can come out for the next 15 to 20 years because you require a data of that particular material for minimum 15 years and it is very costly research work academic institutes also cannot do that industry will not do it because uh, you do not know what is going to be the effect of it why because the newer objections will keep on coming who raises the newer objections who raises the newer objections these are ngos who raise the objections these are ngos ngos world over that this is going to create this problem this is going to create this problem and so whether it is to be accepted or not so uh, every time uh, one objection comes you require further data till that data is completely available the molecule or the material will not get accepted so new generation product with the new technical active ingredients is impossible it is commercially not viable at all if that is the case how do we people in antimicrobial industry work this is the question which should linger in everybody's mind over the decades of past now when i say decades i am talking about 30 40 years i am not talking about just 10 years and 15 years right antimicrobial preservatives continue to face increasing difficulties it's a fact it's a fact that those who are paint manufacturers will realize that they always have a difficulty in antimicrobials according to them it is difficult in antimicrobials but a difficulty exists right that difficulty exists so from the view of desired or expected paint performance the subject become quite complicated which result in a black box effect you only keep on telling that it is not working it is not working it is not what is the outcome everything goes in that black box nothing comes out this is the actual situation as on today then what really happens somebody does a small somebody does a small improvement or some small changes i don't know whether it is improvement or not he gives it to one paint manufacturer that paint manufacturer says it is excellent it worked automatically he passes on to everybody and then people say it did not work am i right or wrong you have faced such problems it did not work so what is really happening over entire thing is going by trial and error nothing else and trial and error at whose cost paint manufacturer's cost but it is not actually paint manufacturer's cost it is a cost of consumers like us consumers like us because we are the consumers we should know what we are consuming and what paint we are getting am i right or wrong right so this is the main problem now from this the supplies of antimicrobials started presenting some new kind of ideas i call them as myths and myths conceptions and biocide industry or antimicrobial industry or the antimicrobial preservatives 
have been loaded very heavily by myths and misconceptions. Very heavily. Very heavily. And these myths and misconceptions have been continuing for the last four decades. Who introduced them? Most unfortunately, all MNC, antimicrobial or biocide manufacturer introduced them. And we very blindly follow them without asking the question that give me the proof for each and every statement what they talk. When I wrote a paper on this, he's here witness. What did you say? They asked whether to publish it or not, right? So the publisher finally had to put a footnote that we may agree or we may not agree. It is, a, it is the author's views, right? And those who want to raise the objections can raise it. Am I right or wrong, right? I did not receive one single objection from anybody across the world. So they knew that these are myths and misconceptions. Did you know about it? Nobody. Nobody. So everybody goes by what is being told. You blindly follow it. And after doing that blind work, at the end of it, you complain that it did not work. Antimicrobials did not work. We have to find out solution. And that is what possibly are talking about new generation antimicrobials. right? Further bitter truth, New York materials for providing the solution becomes a logical thought, which I just said. This particular subject of antimicrobials is heavily loaded also by a lot of contradictions. Lot of contradictions at every step. And we haven't understood that we have been contradicting our own views and our own statements. And, and, uh, by, uh, and without uh, resolving those contradictions, we are still working on it. I have listed here at least about eight or nine contradictions. I can't list every, everything. There are more than 10, 12, 14, 15 contradictions in the subject which have been continued. I'll first present the uh, uh, myths, misconcept, and also contradiction. And then I will say okay, what is now then left for the new generation to come out. Why it is not going? Next one? Yeah. Next one. No, go, go behind. Higher and higher film life is truly a demand from consumers of paint, or is, is marketing game of the paint industry? What is the question? What is the answer? Consumer doesn't know what, is, what he wants. It is we, the paint manufacturers, who are forcing on him that I'm giving you 10 years life, 15 years life, 20 years life. Yes, one way it is correct. When you've got a high-rise building uh, exceeding 15 floors, going up to 55 and 60 floors, you can't repaint that building again and again. So you require longer life, longer, longer film life. Correct. From that point of view, if you're talking about 10 years, 12 years is adequate time, because at the end of it, Every construction uh, needs to be re-attended at the end of the 15 years, 10 years. Absolutely essential. We just can't leave it to the paint and say, okay, the building will last. So maximum you can talk about seven years, eight years. But is there any direct correlation between the antimicrobial used, quantity of antimicrobial used, and what is the shelf uh, paint film life? There is absolutely no correlation which is available. No correlation is available. So it is all assumption. But with this assumption, what happened? Simple funda, add more, get more life. Buy one, get one more. Right? Are we talking about that kind of <laughs> principle in this? No. Right? But this is exactly what has happened. So today, what has happened today? Add more and more preservatives in that. What happens to the preservatives thereafter? Now, I'm going a little beyond the slides also. Right, what happens to the preservatives? Those preservatives are not going to last in that particular portion. I'll come to the multiple contradictions. Those have added further confusions. I'll, I'll show you how, what the confusions are. Right? The fact says that very microbial rich world around us is making our life very comfortable. Right? We require that life. We require that life. But at the same time, we all talk about it, that I want my antimicrobials. 
which will have the uh, action against the largest number of species which can spoil my product. So you require very large spectrum activity. Whether I wanted uh, microbials, antimicrobial, nothing, nothing is being talked about, right? So bottom line is we must take care of each microbial world around. So avoiding unwanted excessive usage of antimicrobials, which can reach to the nature, is absolutely compulsory. Is required. If you disturb this life, you and me cannot exist. Now, what is the situation today? We'll see it. We'll see it. Basic guidelines across the world says use only regulated antimicrobials in regulated dosages. Now, what is regulated antimicrobials and what is regulated dosage? See, there are a lot of uh, uh, toxicity studies done directly on the material. And the impact of these materials onto the nature by way of leach out or by way of unwanted spray. Both are important. But here what, we'll do, what we do, we read MSDS. SDS is meant for what? SDS is meant for the transportation instructions in case something happens, in case accident occurs, what one should do, right? And SDS is derived from what? SDS is derived from basically talk studies on the material, right? SDS has nothing to do with the environment impact, nothing. We don't consider environment impact. We want to only study only, we want to look only at that. The bottom line says what? By following one free will, antimicrobials are getting dosed today. Free will. I want to use 0.3%. Tomorrow I decide I require 10 years life. I put the dry film preservatives, not 0.5%, not 1.2%. Uh, I put 2%. I got a good results. Did that 2% remain inside? Is the next question. So creating age over other product has become a competitive game in the paint industry. Somewhere we should stop it now. Somewhere we should stop it. It is very difficult to make everybody come together and say, yes, let us stop it. But it is bound to happen today or tomorrow. Bound to happen. Whether you like it or not, even the bigger paint industry, and who introduced this game? Those who can afford to add more antimicrobials inside. Those who can afford to add more. Who affords it? Money rich, cash rich people. Because otherwise what will happen? Every time I go to sell, they will say, no, I want something which is cheaper, which is available, right? You want the material to be ch at cheaper price, but you want to add more. Ultimately, you are increasing cost. Isn't it? Why don't you use the regulated right material at right dosage? It solves the problem. I'll show you how it solves the problem. Contradiction number three. Regulation uh, have uh, frozen the permissible dosage of antimicrobials by talk studies and environment impact, but the paints reach to the uncontrollable number of consumers. Uncontrollable, uncountable number of consumers who do not know what they use as a paint, right? And they receive unknown toxins. Why unknown toxins, I said? Simple. If you do not pay attention to the purity of the antimicrobial active going inside. And if you have got impurities, which can have more toxins, what really happens? You receive them. You receive them. Today we all complain that there is an increasing prevalence of cancer. We are complaining today that there is increasing prevalence of steel births, defect, defective births. You don't know from where they came. You don't know where they came. These are the after effects, the impacts of the biocide. Biocide we don't use only in the paints. Biocide we use in everything. Everything, everywhere there is a biocide. Bias, without biocide today, no industrial product can come out. I'm not talking about only water-based product. Even the other products also cannot come out. And even biocide is not required only in the water-based paints. It is required also in the solvent based paints for one simple reason that once the film has been dried, microbes cannot distinguish whether it was done by through aqueous paint or solvent based paint. For them, it is a film. It is the same minerals which are used here and you have used there. Bacteria develop on minerals. Minerals are available plenty. 
what we call as extenders is minerals. You use you load a lot of minerals. Once the film is dried, well, it's the end of it. For bacteria, it is a mineral. They require it. They grow on it, right? That is the reason one of the slides shows over there. Just we'll go to next one also. New material solution often seems to be in creating different combinations of the new active materials. May I ask a question directly? You might have heard that today I got a CIT MIT. You are aware of a CIT MIT, right? This combination. Somebody comes and says, no, I got this combination of CIT MIT, free will combination. Who allowed you to make that combination? Where is the study on it? Where is the study on it? There is no study. There is no record, right? But it has been, it is being given. It is being given to the people. Why it is being given? Because you don't know what is what, right? And then we say, okay, the, uh, this works. So it has become, then they, then they say what? Oh, it did not work. That means there is something wrong. Possibly the bacteria were muta got mutated. And because they got mutated, this particular material is ineffective against those materials. This is contradiction and misconcept both. Both. It is not true story. Now, as a result, what has happened now? There are n number of combinations of the different kind of materials. Nobody is in position to correlate why this combination, why not this combination. Why this combination worked somewhere and why it did not work somewhere else? No correlation whatsoever. This is the only industry in the entire sector which has got everything undecided. Corrosion inhibitors, can you talk about it like this? No, you can't. Emulsifiers, can you talk like this? You, no, you can't. There are, there are definitely some data available. There is definitely something which is available. There are no misconceptions. There are no myths in that. Why the myths and misconceptions are getting loaded only on antimicrobials? is my first question, right? And nobody is coming out of it now, since I keep on shouting like this only, at, at every occasion, the MNC biocide companies have become conscious. It's a big revolution to make them conscious that don't come and spoil my country. What you, can, you can't use in your country, you should not be uh, dumping in my country. You should not be doing it. Are we not doing it? Are they not doing it? They are doing it. Even if they are uh, representatives sitting over here, I will say the same thing. Because we know that it is, it is something which is, has no, no logic, there is no uh, head and tail to it, but it is being given. It is being given. It was okay at that particular time, 30, 25, 30, 40 years back, when the sufficient knowledge wasn't available on the subject. But when you know now, how can you continue what has been uh, created about 25, 30 years back? Are you not using the materials which are being given to you, which were designed 35, 40 years back? Paint industry grew, a lot of inputs paint in. New formulations came out. Biosol industry runs in the same way. How long? A newer generation is required. Your topic was right. I am coming to it. Let's do it further down. Contradiction number five. Paint industry is often willing to increase the dosage of antimicrobials. But the cost of the preservation of a paint increases, which they don't take into account at all. It's a big contra contradiction. Next one. Regarding the efficacy of DFP, uh, how many of you have seen some kind of a test report being provided by the multinational antimicrobial suppliers? Even the ASTM process talks about this inhibition zone. Now, what is inhibition zone? Let's look at the next slide first. And then again, we come back to this slide. The ASTM process, now this is the paint film. This is the plating method of testing. This is the paint film. And what we have been doing is the testing the fungal and algal growth around it. F fungal. So whatever that particular area around this, around this, around the paint film, in which nothing, this is fungi, this is algae. 
algae is vegetation, fungi is not a vegetation, fungi requires dead organic material for its growth, dead organic material, dead mass. So even if the algae dies tomorrow, fungi can grow on it because that becomes a dead mass for the fungi to grow, right? Algae grows by photosynthesis, right? Now, what they do, what they write, they said that this particular area in which fungi has not grown is inhibition zone. And the moment this area is bigger and bigger, they say the biocell is better and better. Completely wrong concept. It means what? From the paint film, antifungal agent migrated, and it killed all the fungi around. So you are allowing the antimicrobial to get migrated. It will get migrated into nature also by usual process. So it is going to come out. It is going to affect all, all of us again. Again, it is going to go to the same waterways, same in environment. It is not required. Now, in this case, what has happened? Only on this film surface, there is no growth. All across it, there is a fungal growth. All across it, there is algal growth. So there is no leaching over here. There is no leaching over here, right? This is new generation dry film preservatives. Now, how we obtain that? How we do it? Let's look at it. But unfortunately, just go to the uh, earlier slide for purpose. But leaching of the anchor is totally undesirable. Due to such leach out from the film, paint manufacturers add more and more dry film preservatives. Now, why it happened? Again, the next misconception. They say that dry film becomes active only after the antimicrobial agent migrates from the film. Fantastic concept. Fantastic misconcept. So they want it to migrate. And for which they put up a new theory. A hypothesis was put. No confirmation on hypothesis, no result. There is not even one single scientific document to say that this hypothesis is validated and it has resulted into a proper theory. Hypothesis next is validation, and then it becomes theory. So what do they talk? They said that it migrates because of the osmosis. Have you not heard? Have you not heard? You have heard that because of the osmotic process, it migrates. My, my question is very simple. Why did the color did not migrate by osmosis? Why the dye did not migrate? Why you did not get the red and pink and uh, a blue rain? It should have migrated, right? Why only the, uh, is it that uh, this osmosis is so uh, specific that only the antimicrobial it picks up and takes it out? Don't you think it is absurd? But is it not this theory is very, very commonly heard by all of you? It's something which is completely absurd. So how long are you going to live on absurd things as of standards is my primary question. Next. Ah. Next, next. I'm purposely silent for a few minutes because I want you to read this. Those who are paint manufacturers will realize that they will always say that whether to accept dry film preservative or not for usage, we require to do the exposure. And only after the exposure studies, we'll, we'll decide whether, the, whether it works or not. Do you know why this was introduced? When there is no answer now, you require something else to, to be put forth as a hypothesis. Without antimicrobial in the paint and without presence of antimicrobial in the film, film will not last even 10, 15 days. What are we talking about? It will not last even 15 days. It will start deteriorating because it will be always attacked by the anti microbes in the nature. But today what has happened? Three years of testing period, exterior exposure, that exterior exposure has got no control parameter. 
there is i do not know what is mean deviation in the results i do not know what is a mean deviation in the test procedure so how can it become a test procedure which cannot be a scientific which is not scientific so are we not loaded with the myth i would say go back to the laboratories the laboratory method of testing preservatives is far more scientific there may be some of one or two lacunas those can be easily handled lacuna like what you will say okay laboratory method is a static method it is not a static method microbial growth is always a dynamic always a dynamic right another issue is raised what, what that there is no sunlight exposure okay give the qv exposure to it let the film deteriorate let the film deteriorate and then you test whether antimicrobial worked or not isn't it because everything goes wrong in the exterior exposure because of three different factors they are related to the paint binders tg value porosity film porosity elongation right film elongation there is a contraction expansion contraction which occurs every day right how long the film will sustain those contraction uh, and uh, elongation over how much period needs to be studied needs to be studied has anybody given me the data is any data being presented there is no data being presented so in the absence of data what becomes more valid expose it to qjv allow it to deteriorate by uv radiation to whatever extent it can be possible exposure need to be given only for 100 hours that is the reason we call it as a qjv 100 qjv 100 has been well standardized method of testing no objection from anybody because it has been established that qjv 100 is more than sufficient to correlate films life for certain period right then do the testing laboratory method but the myth continues that we want to do exposure for 3 years after 3 years everybody forgets the topic what was what was being literally found out what was or what are the findings whether to go for the new antimicrobial or not so antimicrobial supplier keeps on fighting that why you require 3 years when i'm giving you data which has been repeatedly found out and which is con supplier i will be happy if this method is followed because i am not answerable it is nature why should i be answerable it nature deteriorated what do i do so these are the myths and misconceptions created for conveniences i have been shouting on these conveniences for the last 20 years repeatedly that drop these conveniences come to the scientific field come to the science of antimicrobials antimicrobial preservatives then then possibly we can do better and then we can avoid every individual problem next next just just one a footnote earlier earlier slide a footnote in stm test procedure also allows this is important it means what stm people are aware that this is not scientific is the people are aware that this is not scientific but possibly they are under pressure of industry to continue with that particular test procedure without modifying it it does happen in industrial world it does happen in industrial world so footnote exist that subject interpretation is allowed i don't know how how it can continue next so the study topic needed to be the technology and art of formulation of dry films use of formulated dap at the regulated dosages and films antimicrobial performance but against that in india only in india what has started using technical grade diron directly in paints it doesn't happen anywhere else it never happens anywhere else so who permitted this which regulatory body there was a lot of fight on this particular issue 
in Indian regulatory body. The subject has not been resolved, but it continues, it keeps on dragging, right? Nowhere in the world, technical grade diuron can be added into the paint in any quantity what you require. So today what happened, I want to give 10 years life, I dose 2%. I want to give 15 years life, I do two and a half percent, three percent, four percent. You never know what is what, what is happening. I don't get fish, I complain. Why should I eat fish which which might have been toxicated already? Pardon me? Everything is happening. Everything is happening. Are we not aware of it? Are we not worried about our own self first? My question is the same thing. Let's forget about industry. Yes, antimicrobials are 100% required to, to protect the material from the loss, economic loss. Economic loss is not affordable. But now let us limit it rightly and get the maximum benefit. Yep. So now I come to a new generation. Now this is what is defining. Must be free of ambiguity. I don't want any ambiguity. I must give a very clear answer to everybody. Whatever answer you ask, I must have the solution. If I don't have the solution, I must promise you that I'll give solution within certain time. We are ready to work for that, right? Must provide correct answers and solutions. Must eliminate controversial practices. I mentioned the controversial practices, contradictory practices should not carry myths by assumptions and misconception by business conveniences. I elaborated business conveniences, right? Must reduce the consumption of antimicrobials, must. It is too much of a consumption of antimicrobials, which is coming to all of us in return without our knowing about it. Must be human and environment set regularly. It, it, it must meet the regulatory compliances. We must provide sustainable paints to uncountable, unaware mass consumers who do not know what paint is, who do not know what are antimicrobials in that. They do not know what is the dosage in that. They do not know what is going to be the ill effect. Right? Next one. Next one. Next. This is a very, you can take a p mobile picture of this because then every time you will remember where are the challenges? Where are the challenges? This is a precise, see every step has got a mic mi microbial challenge. Every step has got a microbial challenge. Next slide will still elaborate further. Different polymer emulsions, different color shades, different extenders, different additives, different PVC, different storage. Can we have one integrated solution against all those variables is my first question. So the newer generation biocide should address such issues and it is possible. We were taught Fourier transform equations in IITs. That was a subject compulsory even at the PhD level. We had to take the credits. Fourier transform equation is what? You write equation against each parameter and then finally integrate within that domain to get the answer. Right? Technically, this can be done. Technically, that it can be done. And that is exactly the role what we should play. Right? And that is the reason that mathematics never fools us. Mathematics never fools us. That is the only subject which gives always correct answer. Right? So if you solve this equation rightly within the domain, you are likely to get the answer. So you will get the answer for what? You will get the answer for second. You will get the answer for third. Then you integrate all those answers together against each other within that particular domain, what is called as a final Fourier transform equation. Right? Otherwise, that is initially when you put equation against this, it is no operation. Integral equations we are learned in 10th and 12th. Fourier transform equation is not being taught 
uh, up to graduation level. It is taught beyond graduation level, right? So it can be done. Whether it is possible, for which you require data, you require domain. We have got a certain domain to work on this particular thing. We have worked on that domain. We have already said different polymers emulsions also when stored in used tank. Those who are emulsion manufacturers over here will realize the importance of this because they face everyday huge chains, right? Different color shades. Chemistries differ. Chemistries differ. There are n number of chemistries. Can we have one bias at common for to all? No. But can we not come to the approximation by solving the Fourier transformer? Yes, we can. Is that solution? Yes, that is going to be a solution. Because you don't want to hold more inventories. You don't want to create that inventory and keep it for long, because everything has got a shelf life, right? So it becomes important. And that is why I said, finally, last two, facing variation storage conditions, facing variations in water quality, facing variation weathering and rainfall, which is not uh, under our control. Next. Now the, now the subject is going to become more and more complicated, right? Those which can make the paints to perform at the lowest dosage. I would say new generation antimicrobials means those which give at the minimum dosage the best performance. At the minimum dosage give the best performance. By increasing dosage, getting performance is not a solution. It's not a solution, right? Those which are sustainable for continuation of their usage for the long years. You cannot keep on changing your paint formulation. It is impossible because you require a lot of data again on your paints. So whatever you decide today, it should run for the long years. Sustainability also means taking care of unknown but huge number of consumers of paints, which I've been repeating again and again. And we require continuation of microbial world around us. If these five conditions are met, I call them as a new generation antimicrobials. Can we go for the next? Factors which lead to underperformance of paints. Very important. Are you aware why it leads to underperformance? There are only two equations, insufficiency and inefficiency. There is nothing else. There is nothing else. Insufficiency of the preservity in the paint, dosage versus initial microbial load. You do not know what is initial microbial load when you start formulating a paint. So you assume that it is going to be maximum. But these are consumable biocides, consumable antimicrobials. Non-consumable antimicrobials were knocked out long years back. Earlier, non-antimicrobials listed for uh, usage were somewhere in 960 in number. Today, they are only 250 in number. So all those 250 numbers are actually consumable antimicrobials. So they get consumed by whom? They get consumed by microbial world, right? Once added, the consumption can continue, and so their dosage can go down. Their availability for protecting the paint is reduced. Gradual decomposition can also occur. Because of the chemical acid alkali combinations, interactions. So this leads to insufficiency. Inefficiency of preservative error of choice is the first. We made a choice without knowing why we are making a why making use of it. So error of choice, that is error of recommendation by the people who are in the antimicrobial field. Contraindicatory. I add this also, I add this also, these two antimicrobials react with each other, both of them neutralize each other. They are contraindicatory. They will not give any results. So you are wasting by adding more and more dosages of all of them. So this contraindicatory happens quite often in actual practice. Limited activity range, I must, I first, uh, very first subject I said, it should have the very wide activity spectrum. But some antimicrobials can come to the limited activity range. And deterioration in storage. Deterioration storage of what? Not only antimicrobials, 
but the storage of the paints, adding more antimicrobial or preservative is not a solution. Next. This is a very big misconcept. Are you aware what really happens of the paint which is already in the packed can and such paint is stored at your distributors for indefinite period before it gets sold? Temperature every day goes to 40 degrees. At night, it comes down to 20 degrees. Delta T is 20 degrees. How many cycles of such variations of temperature that paint is expected to suffer? Paint will undergo these changes quite often. Will the antimicrobials last? They are sensitive. You have been told not to add certain antimicrobials when the paint temperature is more than 60 degrees. People now limit to 50 degrees also. Have you not heard? Yes. So when, more, uh, at when the temperature of the paint is 50 degrees and you are allowing the temperature to go up and down, up and down n number of times till it is getting sold, are you choosing the right preservative? Question? It's a question. So choice of preservative is a major issue over here. What can be done? We'll answer it. Next. Are you aware of the chlorum sensing signal of the microbial species? Chlorum sensing. It's a something which subject is not known to many people, even those who are in the antimicrobial field for the last 40 years. What is chlorum sensing? Chlorum sensing is cell-to-cell -cell communication process that enables the microbes to collectively modify behavioral response or behavioral pattern on receiving external threat towards likely changes in the cell density, that means in the composition of the microbes, and the species and the surrounding microbial community too, not only me, but my community otherwise also, right? For their survival together. Survival together is a principle of nature. If it is not a human principle, it is a nature principle, right? So what really happens? moment one or two species continue to live, even though the my antimicrobial is added, they generate the mechanism, which is known as a quorum census, so that under other <coughs> microbial species can also accordingly modify their external structure, environment, their own internal environment in such a way that they can sustain. That is the reason these microbes, which originated thousands of years earlier to us, are still continuing today. We came much later. They came much earlier to us. And they are still surviving. But how did antimicrobial industry or, or the biocide industry uh, interpret it? They interpreted it as if it is a mutation of the species which is occurring. And so what was the advice given to you? Change the biocide pre frequently. Today you are using this. Tomorrow you use this. Afterwards, again, you come back to this. If it doesn't work, then I'll give third one. Tell me it happens or not. It happens, right? Why it happens? Because the quorum sensing is not known. So again, I say the same thing. This particular industry loaded with so many myths, misconception. Next. Next. Corrosion control coating. I just mentioned that Microbes cannot distinguish other film once it has dried. Corrosion control co coatings must have antimicrobials in that. Even the military standard specifications or airworthy specifications, there is an ASTM test procedure which I conducted somewhere in the year 1988. Not only me conducted, American guys conducted, uh, the, uh, our Air Force uh, laboratories, uh, naval laboratories, they conducted this test just to see whether they meet that MIL STD 810G section 508.7. How many of us are really adding the antimicrobials in the corrosion control coating? No. We are spending huge money. By the time 
say you have got been given a five kilometers long pipeline, by the time you reach to that end painting, this end starts corroding. Who corrodes them? Microbes. How do how what they do? The paint expands, expands contraction next because contraction of steel and contraction of paint film cannot match. So finally, film cracks, microbes get inside it. The film also becomes softer. Microbes become part of it. They start excre excreting or discarding the materials which are acidic, which leads to corrosion. Right. So corrosion control coating actually require antimicrobial. We have them. Next. A rather sensitive question. How do you choose biocide? I have been always told when I go to somebody, I said, demanding certain composition of preservative. Oh, I want this, this combination of preservative. This, this, this much percent of this, this much percent of this active, this much percentage of this active. Why? Who decided that? Somebody told me. I've been using this, so you give me that. Are, but if you are already using that combination, if you are not getting the results, why are you asking for the same combination again? It's my basic question. Am I right or wrong? So that means what? Something which has not been understood, but it continues. Next is what? By asking for the rate. So I want something cheaper. Right? I always see that everybody interprets biocide or antimicrobial preservative is the area for the cost control. That's it. There is nothing else now left. Talk only about the cost of the antimicrobial. Or if that material is used to the 0.2 and 0.3 percent level, it doesn't make even 2 and 3 percent difference in per liter of a paint. What are you talking about a cost control? What are we talking about cost control? You are spoiling your paint if you don't have adequately used the material and right material. And that loss is much more than, than the same which you do by asking for the buyer at low rate. But we don't realize that. By doing paper comparison of different products, SDS matching. Oh, what is written in this SDS? What is written in that SDS? If it doesn't match, I don't want it. Our SDS mentions only that. Nothing else, nothing beyond that. How you formulate a preservative is important. Is very important. Because that is going to decide the film's performance. That is going to decide even the wet state performance. We don't realize that. We only look at the SDS and say, it doesn't match or it does. Why should it match? My formulation technology is my technology. I advanced it by doing a lot of work, research on it. So why you look at only SDS and say it doesn't match? A wrong way. Exp expressing need of conducting some more trials. Give me the samples, we'll conduct trial, come after six months and we'll give results. After six months, when you go over there, the paint sample is still on the shelf, untouched. I mean, preservative sample is still there, untouched. Is practically the situation. Right? Nobody, because people, what to test is not known. Then adding something in it and testing it. Do you know how the weight state preservative should be tested? Do you know how it should be tested? Suppose you want to find out it's if, uh, whether it works or not for 15 months. Then you have to have 15 tins of the paint ready in which you have to add. Every month you pick up one, test it, discard that. Like that you continue for 15 months. Has anybody done it? Has anybody done it? No. Major problem. By asking a question, what is new with you? Whenever I hear this question, what is new with you, I knew, I know that people are not interested in listening to me. So it's a very simple question to avoid any new supplier. What is new with you? If you don't have anything, you don't. We have got everything right now going quite well. Am I taking too long time? Can, we, can I continue? Yeah. Offering low-cost formulation of antimicrobial is very easy. A very bold statement, I made it. A volcano of toxins is most likely to erupt in the near future from the effects of ill-formulated antimicrobial percolating in India. 
the question is almost always asked natural antimicrobial antimicrobial is derived from nature it's a very good concept he also talked about uh, 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 pigments derived from nature like plants and all that kind of thing it's one question here you require a range you require a certain stability you require certain data you just can't say okay this particular terpene works so it can be used as an antimicrobial because there is no such data which is available it is risky but did you know uh, one simple one announcement which ispa did few few months back i'll show you the announcement which ispa did i okay let's let's i'm just shorting it right the dry film preservatives no these subjects are important there will not be any question at the end of it i'm exp I, i'm sure about it <laughs> not a joke not a joke <laughs> not a joke but the subject should be told in this way i was a teacher anyway uniform presence of dfp is the most basic myth you have been using three materials one anti algal one anti fungal and one anti bacterial these three dots represent that if they remain together in this particular form in identical proportion i will call it as uniform presence but if they scatter like this in the film when film dries can it be a uniform presence then wherever there is no anti algal algal growth will occur that is one of the one primary reason when you always find on the walls microbial growth appearing in patches you don't find everything green all algae patch of green patch of black right why because there is no uniform distribution to solve this particular problem we did the first original contribution in the year 2405 which is known as a next one poly encapsulated dry film preservatives it was introduced in the year 2004 2005 in germany i presented this particular thing the end effect all mnc bio five manufacturers started working on the same thereafter the next material from them came 9 years after us and till today none of the mnc biosat manufacturers have encapsulated all the three active ingredients together they are giving one material encapsulated second material encapsulated third material encapsulated again adding it inside it's completely meaningless again right but this is the fact but you re read what you read this that okay my material is encapsulated next there are a lot of things which i eliminate in between this is a new material which we created which will run for the next 30 40 years it's it's based upon solid state chemistry there is no new, no myth has been told on this there is no misconception there is no diuron in it it gives very long duration protection and best part of it it is most cost effective because its required dosage is very very low if you require 1% diuron in comparison i get the same results by using 0.3% of this material both cost the same so you are reducing the price you are reducing the cost of preservation of the print this is derived by inclusion of non antimicrobial agent in the multiple voids of inorganic chemistry let's forget about it it's complex but i'll just show the picture how it looks like see this is a crystal structure every crystal has got a defect every crystal at the at the final stage it has got defect there are several defects here you can see void here you can see the overlap here you can see something similar right what we did in this void introduce something by doing by following certain techniques in solid state chemistry now this is nothing new your copper thiocyanin is the same process copper thiocyanin is the same process entire electronics is the same process entire mobile technology is the same process right we converted into 
antimicrobial process. That's it. Nothing, not that we did something different. But we chose the material by studying what could be, what can give the best effect, right? So we in, introduced in that particular voids, in the crystal defects, a new material. That material is not new. It is still known and accepted antimicrobial in the field of biocides. Very well accepted globally. And we found that it gives amazing result. So it became a new dry film preservative. This is the picture of it. Previous one. And finally, I'll, after showing this, this is the act, act, exact, exact molecule. This is the complex, complex structure which we created and in which we introduce. Now, finally, I'm coming to it because the time is running out. With this particular material, we introduce the synergy systems of biocide, synergy systems of preservative. Now, what is the meaning of synergy system? Synergy means by using minimum, getting maximum. Using minimal, getting maximum. Why? Because each of them is going to contribute their positive effects and trying to eliminate the negative effects. So we have got now three different synergy systems for the exterior paint, for the interior paints, for the low PVC, mid PVC, high PVC paints, which is which are going to run for next 20 years, definitely. We have got a global patent on it. We have taken patent even in China, so I don't want Chinese to repeat it, right? And it will be available to you. Can we, next one, next one. With this, the newer generation antimicrobials really start. Wait for some more time. There are going to be some more announcement from us for further more improvements on which we have been already working. Results have been good. So that really solves the problem of the the whole damn thing what we have been working is completely bound by eco-social governance. Now this word eco has got two meanings. Eco is ecology as also economics. If I want to give ecologically the best material, be sure that economics is going to get disturbed because it is going to be costly. Right? So can that be a solution? No. So the solution should be eco-social governance when I say it in includes ecology as well as economy for traceable social benefits. What is traceable social benefits? Benefits to the n number of the consumers of paints, n number of the consumers of other items, including your cosmetics, where you use antimicrobials in very large quantity on your body, on your skin, on your clothes, on everything, whatever you use on practically every industrial product what comes out, right? So everything has to come exactly according to this social, eco-social governance is what our principle is. I think with this, I will stop this next slide to conclude about it. We are today exporting to more than 60 countries. We'll continue to do that with everybody's help. Thank you very much. I think after this presentation, nobody will have any doubt about the biocide, and there will be probably no question from biocide. But sir, I have one question. Yes. I'm here. I'm here. See, the generally all water-based paints are formulated in the range of pH 9 to 12, whether it is interior paint or exterior paint or undercoat, whatever it is. When we are using incan preservatives, CIT, MIT base, if the alkali is added to the CIT, MIT, what will happen? It will decompose. Simple. It is known. It is known. That is one of the reasons why it doesn't work. That is that is one of the reasons why it gets modified by form formaldehyde donors and many other things, right? That is one of the reasons why we say that okay, and and. Uh, People, the regulators also know that increasing CIT-MIT is not a solution, 
right? But there are ways to use that material also. It depends how you make the formulation. Those are the trade secrets which I cannot disclose, but there are ways to do it. And there are ways also to give the alternatives, which will still remain in the cost range, and it will give the performance, right? So there are solutions which are available. In fact, uh, there is a complete misconcept about 5 ppm presence of uh, CIT, MIT in paints. You are aware of it. Uh, and unfortunately, it was not explained what it means. People started talking about it, let's add only the 5 ppm of CIT, MIT. It never worked. The concept is, since it is a extremely skin irritant, extremely skin irritant, and since painter has got habit of putting his hand inside the paint and stirring the paint, they say that it should not remain in the paint finally beyond 5 ppm. So whatever you had earlier, it, but it doesn't remain because it decomposes much faster. It decomposes much, much faster. It is very difficult to estimate also what is remaining inside, right? Because there is no confirmed test method to find out what is the presence of CIT, MIT, especially CIT remaining in the paint after you are added it and after the paint has matured, maybe for three months, four months in storage. So it's a completely, uh, uh, I would say, the black box where only questions are there, no answers, but there are alternatives which are available. Yes. Yes. No, not not necessarily. I'm cutting cutting you short. Not to not to uh, for a simple reason that whatever biocide reach to you, I may not class them as ethically right. I may not after knowing what biocides are. See what has happened. There are there are regulatory aspects which are already well defined, right? Since ordinarily the user is not in position to analyze everything of it, and since he wants at the lowest and lowest and lowest cost, because he see, he feels that bias is a very heavily cost, right? They do what? They do the cheapening of the bias sites. If I do that, I eliminate minimum three to four processes. It will save a lot of money but you are at the risk. Now, that is the ethics behind the business. That is the reason, that is the reason my arrow goes to that ethical buy side. Thank you so much, sir. Um, can we have, uh, now may I request uh, uh, Dr. Harish Agarwal? to uh, felicitate uh, Mr. Kunte. And uh, Dr. Pathare as well. You won't go ahead. Uh, now, I would like to call upon Mr. Watts to uh, conclude the session and give the vote of thanks. Good evening, friends. Uh, thanks is not a easy word for me. Uh, this is obligation on us. I really thanks all of you. You have come and joined us today and give moral support to us. I also thanks 
to our speakers who have delivered their educational and valuable words to the house. I think you will get and update your knowledge for today's session. Once again, thanks you very much and hope we'll see you tomorrow in the morning in the same hall. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a small announcement. Uh, uh, you can disperse now, but uh, we'll see you again for dinner by 8 o'clock, the same place where we had lunch, and see you tomorrow morning by 10 o'clock. Thank you so much.